Okay. All right. So the next screen is the uh, the overview of the LNG uh, processing scheme. That is from the uh, from the wells down to the uh, production of the LNG. And uh, of course, we've got here the gas wells and the reception and the on-site or facilities to re receive the gas. Any kind of liquids are knocked out, uh, sent to condensate, stabilization, storage, and processing. Then, of course, the gas moves along after taking out all of the liquids and the and the like from uh, from the wells. Then, of course, it's treated for acid gas removal. The acid gas is, of course, the, removing the hydrogen sulfide and the carbon dioxide, which would be very detrimental to have in our in the product. First, it's taken off to acid gas treatment, typically a sulfur plant. Okay, and then we see here in the uh, red uh, balloon, this will be our S uh, SPM 3401, our LNG simulator representing this part of the process, the whole supply chain. Does not include uh, the natural gas liquids. This would be the fractionation uh, section here. Of course, we're taking the gas in, uh, doing a dehydration, uh, mercury remo removal in the front end of the uh, LNG process. Then, of course, taking out uh, in the liquefaction area, we will take out some natural gas liquids, and that's this line down to fractionation. We will liquefy it and make liquefied natural gas, LNG. And there may be some reinjection, and we do have some reinjection of LPG we can put back into, uh, into the LNG through the main cryogenic heat exchanger and then into the final product. OK? Is that clear? Yes. OK. So next, the, the SPM. Well, we got somebody else coming in, do we? I hear the ding. Did somebody else arrive? No. I had a uh, a chime indicating there was some entry or or somebody exiting. Everything, everybody's there. Yes, everybody is there. Okay, this is some kind of noise I had. Okay. The SPM thirty four zero one, the simulator is based on loosely or mostly the air products uh, propane, propane pre-cooled mixed refrigerant process. The, uh, are you, Mr. Babu and uh, Mr. Menon, are, are you familiar with that? Yes. I'm sorry? Yes, yes. Oh, very good. So I don't have to yeah, go yeah, too yeah, much okay. through this. Okay, so yeah. anyway, the, this is a uh, something I took out of uh, some documentation, uh, and of course we'll see our diagrams. I don't know if you have them yet, but they show you the difference between yes. this sheet, and I basically marked it up, and you can see where the red is. What we don't is not in the scope of uh, of the process. Okay, so the um, we use a mixed refrigerant system as we see down here, to provide the refrigeration into the main cryogenic heat exchanger. Okay, we also have the C3 refrigeration system. Uh, in SPM 3401, it's a three-stage. This shows a four-stage uh, system. We're only having a three-stage. Another little difference in the SPM 3401 from the AC, this particular flow sheet, is we don't have this uh, condenser here for the scrub column. Well, actually, the condenser will actually be a service in the main cryogenic heat exchanger instead. So our condenser con condenser service will be in the main cryogenic heat exchanger, and it will come back out to the reflux drum, and then the reflux right. will be taken back to the scrub column. Okay. Yeah. And of course, the mixed refrigerant, you know, we have a propane uh, refrigeration system, of course, using essentially pure propane. Three stages in the SPM 3401. And we have the mixed refrigerant, 
uh, integrated the same way, except we only have four, three stages of the C3 refrigeration, not four as shown in this diagram. So we'll have three stages in the SPM 3401 uh, to cool the mixed refrigerant to exhaust the heat from that system so that we can get uh, uh, good refrigeration into the main cryogenic heat exchanger. Okay, and of Which course, mixed you eliminate? Sorry? Which one you eliminated, LP or HHP? Uh, well, that's a question of just, ref it's just relative. Uh, I, I, I would say the HHP, but of course, uh, probably the HHP, I think we're down uh, to be honest, I don't know their, the, what they call low pressure. Well, probably, probably the HHP. So, but I think it's all relative. Okay. Everything's just relative. Okay. But we'll see the, we'll see the particular conditions when we see, actually look at the simulator, and then you can okay. judge, you know, from the, uh, from the pressure levels. Okay. Good okay. question. Um, yes. We, another difference is we don't have this expander system as shown in here. We just have a throttle valve, and we go into the uh, to flash off any of the nitrogen. Try to just flash off as much of the nitrogen as we can, and then uh, you know, we take off the LNG and pump it to storage. And then downstream, we take the flash gas, and then we do the same. We have a compressor, and then off the fuel gas. So very, 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 very close to this type of flow. This this flow sheet, very, very close. So if you're familiar with this. It'll be very simple, well, say very simple, it'll be straightforward to learn the uh, SPM 3401 uh, flow sheet. Okay? Yeah. Any other questions? No, no we are following. Okay, Go good. Ahead. All right, let's continue, please. So uh, this is just a brief uh, copy of uh, something from the actual instructor manual. I forget what page, but the, the beginning of the process description. Uh, just an overview of the four particular steps involved. Uh, again, chilling and dehydration, separating out the heavier compounds, liquefaction of the feed gas, and then removal of the nitrogen. That's the flashing and then compression of the, the flash gas. OK, and we have two, as we saw, two uh, refrigeration systems, mixed refrigerant and propane. Okay. Uh, the mixed refrigerant system is very nice um, in that it gets us down to the temperatures that we need to liquefy uh, the, um, the natural gas. So we have to get the temperatures down to about minus 150 degrees. And we can do that because the mixed refrigerant system with the multiple gases can get us down to 160 degrees, minus 160 degrees. So we've got a 10, 10 degree differential on the on the uh, on that end of the process. Okay, and of course the C3 refrigeration system. I'll let you be the judge if we we have HHP or if it's LP. That's different. Uh, we have the refrigerant levels are at minus 37, minus 12 degrees C, and plus 9 degrees C. Okay. So yeah. that's that's where we can get to on those three stages. Okay, and of course the heart of the process as we have down below the LNG is the main cryogenic heat exchanger. Uh, of course you're familiar with uh, the process so you know that it's a specially engineered to achieve the uh, liquefaction using the mixed refrigerant system. And um, what we'll do next, okay, just feed and product, very, very, very rudimentary, very basic information. We're taking in natural gas as a, as a feed. We're taking in LPG from the uh, NGL plant for reinjection, and we're going to produce liquefied natural gas, fuel gas coming from the uh, flash of the LNG before going to storage. And we're going to produce liquids from the scrub column that will be sent to the natural gas liquids uh, processing section, which is not in our scope. OK. This is an overview the, uh, from the instructor uh, manual, the overview of the streams. We can see the feed gas 
uh, pressure, assumed uh, in temperature, and our flow rate, we're feeding, uh, feeding 420, almost, almost 429 tons per hour. And LNG to storage, uh, 367 tons per hour. I don't know what that works out to per day, but you can multiply by 24 and we can get the answer. Okay, our fee gas composition at design uh, is listed. We've got a fairly a decent amount of nitrogen mixed in and some of the uh, little heavier compounds. Okay, some of the, uh, the re-injected LPG, you can see that rate, 16 tons an hour, and that composition. Okay, um, of course, so we're making making the scrub column bottoms go into the natural gas liquids distillation. And uh, you can see we're separating out those these compounds from the feed are now ending up in the scrub column bottoms. And then this is our LNG to storage. With the reinjection, we're getting a, uh, a good amount of these, a fair amount of these compounds. Um, we don't quite get all the nitrogen out, but we'd like to, but uh, we do a significant reduction of the nitrogen uh, fraction. And then the fuel gas that's flashed off is mostly just methane and nitrogen at the end. Okay. That's that. And of course, if you're chemical engineers, you'll be very, very, very right at home with this TQ curve. Um, one of the things that some of us, some of the non-engineers don't really understand is that by using the mixed refrigerant system, we can tailor or match the, the temperature uh, uh, versus uh, heat curve more closely. And because this differential, because a differential between the uh, LNG uh, cooling curve and the mixed refrigerant is closer, we of course can attain a higher efficiency process. Of course, the, the closer the the closer the curves are, of course, the bigger the equipment has to be made to make the heat transfer. However, the more efficient the, the, the cycle becomes. Because we're avoiding, as you can see in the beginning, these steps uh, and the, uh, the mono component refrigerant, the C3 refrigerant system, we're going through these uh, constant uh, temperature uh, evaporations. So the mixed refrigerant now lets us get closer to the actual TQ curve of the, the process side. Okay. Yeah, we got it. I'm sorry? Uh, we got it clearly. Yes. The curve is very nice. Thanks. Okay, good. Okay, just a quick look. Of course the you know the, the, the central part of the process, the main cryogenic heat exchanger, for those who haven't seen it before, this is a um, a spiral wound heat exchanger shows some of the complexity of fabricating these types of heat exchangers. Quite a bit of engineering goes into that and fabrication details. Just a couple of pictures just for just for reference. Okay. We have a number of tubes on that. I'm sorry? We have a number of tubes, something like 2,400. Something like that. I don't know how many are in, you know, in our simulation, of course, everything's kind of lumped. We don't know the exact number, but um, we don't have a real, of course, we don't have a real heat exchanger. We don't have a real one, so that's what's nice about a simulator. <laughs> it's a lot cheaper <laughs> than making something like this. No, it's, a, Sorry? it's only two bundles, right? Not three. How many bundles? Two well, bundles or three bundles? We'll talk about that next. Uh, anyway, I have a basic refrigeration okay. system here. I don't want to go, okay, we'll talk, how many bundles, let's get right over to the TF&E. Well, here's our uh, schematic of the services. So that's what we've got. We've got the one, two, three uh, levels. And then we have the mixed refrigerant coming in um, at different levels, the vapor, the liquid. Okay. All right, so let me go back. Vikar, are, are you uh, familiar with the refrigeration systems? Yes, yes, yes. All right, so I put this, uh, just in case, I put this little schematic together just to make it simpler. And just a quick review, um, 
refrigeration system is a sing this is a single stage uh, and then you, of course if you want multi-stage you just hook up of course more stages to it but in essence just to review very briefly um, starts with circulating a refrigerant around uh, by compressing it you bring it from a low pressure vapor to a high pressure vapor and in compression we're, we're to to increase the pressure we have to put some work into it from a from a gas turbine or a steam turbine or some kind of driver, maybe an electric motor. We put work in through the shaft that will heat up and make the, uh, make the pressure higher in the refrigerant on the discharge of the compressor. Temperature will go up. We will remove the heat of compression and we will also remove the heat that we're pushing into the system that we're trying to cool something with. And that will come out of the condenser the condenser will exhaust that heat somewhere eventually, either if not directly through another refrigeration system, eventually that heat will be exhausted to atmosphere, to the ambient conditions. So the heat will be taken out through the condenser. The liquid that, uh, of the refrigerant as it condenses is collected into a receiver and from the receiver is then distributed into an evaporator. Of course, in our process, we have multiple evaporators, so there will be a distribution system from the receiver to the evaporators. That's at the, this is a high pressure system. If we add more levels, the, the, these evaporators will then become the receivers for the lower levels. So the evaporators in the multi-stage system will actually become the intermediate receivers for the lower pressure stages as the, as the, um, the liquid is being used, there'll be an excess amount, and then this will then be routed from the from this pressure stage to another no lower lower pressure stage. So the evaporators become another possible. Some of the evaporators are used as additional receivers in a multi-stage system. Okay, so we go through a Joule-Thomson, we go through a valve. We have a Joule-Thomson effect. We call it. A, we'll call. It, I'm just calling it a Joule-Thomson valve here could be a, a standard control valve designed for flashing. Of course, the re refrigerant from high pressure goes to low pressure. In the process, some vapor will be generated. The temperature of this stream will drop uh, according to the vapor liquid equilibrium, depending upon the pressure in the evaporator. And then it will boil off based on the heat coming in by the process stream. So we're putting heat in to the refrigerant. It will boil off and then produce the, the vapor, and then it will go back for recompression into the compressor. And through the whole cycle, we're putting heat in, evaporating, putting work in, increasing the temperature, exhausting heat. So that heat goes from here to here, plus you pick up any additional heat of compression has to be exhausted out the condenser. And then it starts again. Okay. Yeah. All right. So all we're going to do now is learn the details of what the SPM 3401 program uh, is all about with respect to the refrigeration systems. What I've got here for this one is the actual simulation PNID. Um, as we um, go through this, one of the things you're going to find on the simulator is this, the PNIDs, we have uh, uh, six of them, I believe. Scrub column. And then we have uh, the interlock system showing our, our interlock drawings. Do you have copies of those yet? Do you have these drawings yet? These are the ones I sent this morning. He's checking for it. We didn't receive it from our end, so Vikar has gone to check it out. Okay. So uh, when, when you receive those, then we'll be able to go through those. You can write notes on them as we go along. That would be, be better if you do have a printed copy. Um, what I want to do, though, is to show you the difference. These are the, the simulation PNIDs. This is, not, this is actually you know, what, you would, what we, uh, you, we use for a simulator just to design it. However, just like in a real plant, you have a PNID, and then of course you have a process schematic on the control system. 
And so I'm calling up now the um, on the simulator. I'm going to give you the, the showing you the difference between the two. Of course, we have more color on this uh, just for presentation purposes. And of course, the the layout we can't uh, make the layout as compact as it is on the PNIDs. So we've got a lot of a lot of instrumentation here, but we can't fit all of that equipment and detail onto our schematics just because of the the text size and everything that was that the, that is the uh, standard for the uh, for the drawings. So there be there won't be an exact match. Basically, what I'm trying to explain is there won't be an exact match one for one between the PNID number and the schematic number. You'll probably have some multiple, mul you'll, I, not probably, we will have some multiple uh, information. It will appear maybe on two different uh, schematics on the simulator. Whereas on the simulation PNID, it's on one. Okay, so if you, to learn the simulator, what I recommend is to learn the the simulation PNIDs first, and then it'll be a little bit confusing in some spots because of this, uh, the fact that it's not one for one uh, on the on the DCS. But as long as you understand the process, see all the equipment, and then when you go to the uh, from the PNIDs, when you go over to the the, the simulator schematics, um, you'll be able to make the um, the transition, you know, may, may, may you know, be able to understand it, I think, easier that way. So we'll go through the PNIDs first, and then we'll just uh, then review the schematics. Okay? All right. Do you need a, do you need a break to go find the, uh, to see if you can get the uh, drawings, or? Yeah. Okay, he's printing now. We got his printing now. Thank okay, you. good, good. Yeah, if you need to take a break, why don't you just take a couple of minutes and while there is a printing, and then when, they, when we get them back, um, when you get those, then we'll continue. Is that okay? Oh, yeah. yeah, that's fine for you as well. Huh? <laughs> only your side is only talking. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Um, Yeah, uh, hi, Ray. 
um, back. Hello. Yeah, so we have these four pages with uh, simulation PNID uh, for uh, LNG feed gas. Then uh, we have for heat exchanger. The third one is uh, mix refrigerant. And the fourth one is LNG interlock. Only, only four? Yeah. You don't have the, the scrub column, for example? If you look on the, if you look what I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling through, you should have these types of drawings, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There is scrub column also. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There is two sides. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have six of them. Uh -oh. Yes. Both the sides it is. Yeah. Yeah, so we have all the eight, yes. Eight numbers are there. Okay, are they all on one page or they they were they were uh Yeah, it both sided. In I'm sorry. Uh, two, two sided uh, one print. So we got one page and the other side also we have got eight numbers of PIDs. Okay, eight that's numbers. fine. Okay, you have eight total P and IDs, good. Okay. Yeah. What we'll, what we'll do is we'll start with P and ID number one, and I have that up on the screen on my uh, computer. Okay. So let's review. This is the uh, mixed refrigerant uh, propane precooling process. Um, we're starting here at the battery limit in the upper left of the diagram. I'm just going yeah. to zoom in a little bit here. Just bear with me a little bit. We'll go up in this way. Okay. So the V gas from the uh, the sweet um, natural gas comes from our this is our battery limit, and uh, yeah. we'll assume that pressure is constant uh, in the simulator. Uh, the gas will come in at this point, and they I believe the fee, the V gas pressure can be adjusted by the instructor to set up a um, a uh, as a fault, so they can adjust that pressure to. Uh, to make different uh, scenarios for training, for example, loss of loss of the uh, the pressure in the header, or maybe a decreasing pressure in the header over time. Okay. Uh, we have a feed gas valve. We have a flow controller FIC five zero one. FIC five zero one is normally in cascade mode. It is set point is being adjusted from PIC five twenty one which is on the top of the scrub column. And this is the, the of course, the, one of the, uh, the, the two most important uh, control loops in the plant to control the total, to control the, control the total throughput of uh, gas uh, depends on the capacity of the main cryogenic heat exchanger to condense uh, LNG to a particular temperature. And there is a uh, control loop at the back end of the plant on the main cryogenic heat exchanger, which will adjust how much material is taken from the scrub column and put through the main cryogenic heat exchanger to achieve the particular target LNG temperature coming out of the main cryogenic heat exchanger. So depending upon uh, the speed at which the mixed refrigerant system is working, um, you'll be able to yeah. uh, condense uh, uh, that amount of uh, uh, that particular amount of LNG and then that controller will yeah. then affect the pressure of the scrub column by drawing more or less gas from it to supply the main cryogenic heat exchanger. In turn, PIC 521, which is on the top of the scrub column, will then adjust the feed rate to keep the pressure uh, at a relatively constant value by increasing the feed rate or decreasing it. Okay? Yeah. All right. And we see we also have an interlock here, interlock 500. When interlock 500 is activated, it will close the valve and it will put the uh, flow controller into manual and its output will be set to 0%. We'll see this later, of course, in the interlock diagrams, but we've also got that listed here on the P&IDs. 
And one of the things about the PNIDs, you can see this kind of detail better than you can see it on the simulator. The simulator is more for the operators, you know, direct control to see the, the values. But we've got more, you know, as, as it is in the real plant, you get more detail on the PNID on the PNIDs about the the functionality and the connections of the interlock logic. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we take our feed gas and we do our first pre-cooling of the feed. And the, we're using a high-pressure C3 refrigerant. It's coming from the receiver in the C3 refrigeration system. That will be coming in under level control. We're going to have a certain boil-off rate depending upon our feed rate and our outlet temperature. The outlet temperature we want to achieve, we don't want to achieve too cold a temperature. Why? Who can answer that question? Too cold? We, we have a temperature controller here, but we don't want to get too cold. The question is, why don't we want to get too cold in this heat exchanger in the, on the feed gas? Well, what's our first objective? Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. We don't want to knock out any heavy hydrocarbons at that stage. Yeah? Yes, but more importantly, more importantly, remember the water. There is a little bit of water in the feed, a little, you know, nice. uh, small concentrations. And if there is more, if we go too cold on this, uh, um, the, uh, the this evaporator E five hundred one, if the outlet temperature becomes too cold, we'll start freezing up in yeah. here. So we don't want to get too cold. Yeah. So this is a special situation where we actually have a pressure controller on the and a control valve on here, so we can actually regulate directly instead of instead of connecting this vapor stream that goes into the refrigeration compressor. It would normally most of the um, most of the evaporators, the pressure will float off of the pressure in the compressor, depending upon of course flow rates and the compressor speed. However, in this case, we're actually regulating the pressure in the uh, on the shell side of this evaporator, so we can maintain this particular temperature. Otherwise, if we just did not, if we had a wide open control valve, this pressure will just follow the com the uh, compressor, the refrigeration compressor's pressure on the high pressure system, and then we would get whatever temperature falls out of here. And if it's too low, then we'll have freezing. So we have this. Um, control strategy here for that purpose. Okay? Yeah, you got it. All right. Good. So then we proceed on down and we have a knockout drum. So if there's any water and any, any um, carryover that comes in from the header, any kind of uh, water knocked out, any kind of hydrocarbons, those, those will be drained off in this drum, separated from different levels, and then will be sent to uh, battery limit for treatment or disposal. OK? Uh, wow. Very basic. OK. If, uh, from the overhead of the knockout drum, we're taking the gas off. Um, i got to get this moving up here. We're going to take the gas off. Oops. OK. And the gas will come overhead from the knockout drum. And then we go into one of the molecular sieve dryers. The molecular sieves, of course, primary purpose is to absorb any residual water, because we don't want that to get further down into the process for freezing. We don't want to have any problems in our heat exchangers with ice buildup as we get the temperatures lower and lower. The other thing that's going to happen, we're going to get some mercury removal. And any other kind of compounds that might come in, maybe a little H2S, whatever might absorb, we're going to try to get that up on the molecular sieve uh, bed. We don't simulate the molecular bed sieves in detail. In other words, we don't do a real, uh, we assume they're always operating correctly, um, except in the case if there's, a, if there's a particular fault that might have a problem. So we're not going to do a very detailed, uh, for example, we don't have the uh, temperature profile when we're doing a regeneration or when we're doing uh, in normal service we're not we're not we're not going to show that we're providing this uh, mainly as to show that there, okay, there's a unit here uh, 
and that it has a particular function in the process and that you have to be aware of that but we're not going we're not exposing to the operator we haven't done in detail the simulation of the, the molecular sieves however they can practice all the operations for example uh, when you want to regenerate you can actually uh, use the controls over here uh, for the regeneration where we're taking fuel gas off uh, from battery limit we're going to take a particular flow of fuel gas we're going to heat it up we have to get it warm so we can regenerate it and we're going to use exhaust from the uh, uh, gas turbine on the um, mixed refrigerant system and that'll be our heating medium for the fuel gas and then the fuel gas will go in and be used to regenerate one of the beds and then that fuel gas will be taken off it'll absorb any water and then it'll be taken off and it has to be cooled so it goes through a condenser here or a cooler I'm sorry and then a cooling water a air cooler and then a cooling water uh, exchanger and then any water that's picked up is knocked out and separated and sent off the battery limits under pressure control so this system will allow the operator to do to practice some of those uh, those operations as I said it won't the, the molecular sieves aren't simulated in, in in great detail however the controls related to the um, to the regeneration are are simulated okay any questions on that so that means there is no sequential changeover of the molecular beds, only the direct simulation of the uh, re regeneration system and yes. the separate is that's only there. Right, okay. yeah. Because, because normally normally in the process they might have, for example, a, uh, uh, a system on here that does the automatic switching of the valves and the like, and there will be some sequencing program. Um, we it was beyond the scope of when we developed the program to to put that level of detail in for someone just learning the process it's something they can get in an yeah. advanced training so but yes the 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 the, the, the actual systems would be more comp complex in that regard but at least they can they can see the uh, the basic controls that they'd have to operate once they get to that unit uh, that equipment okay yeah good Good point, good point. Okay. Good right. Good point. Right. And then you see the note there. Note two beds are in service. One is in regeneration. It's automatic operation. So we don't expose the automatic operation. It's just an assumption. Okay. Okay. And uh, this is a, all of this information I'm giving you is explained in detail in the instructor manual. So I'll just give you, you know, point you in the right direction and give you some things. And if you forget something, just please, the instructor manuals very good I know because I wrote it <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I hope it's good at least to, uh, other customers have said it's very good so um, and if you need any more you know you have any questions then you can always just contact uh, Timtronics in the, uh, the the number they got but it sh most of the information you're looking for should be in the uh, uh, right there in the instructor manual okay and if there is a question you can ask us no that's it 500 pages are equal to instructor giving five words. Eh? Sometimes. What, what is that? 500 words in a manual is better. It is not better. Five words from the instructor itself. Eh? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's correct, yeah. Thank you, is it thank you the, very much. Yeah. Okay. So then coming out of the molecular yeah. sieves, the gas comes out and we go through a filter yeah. to remove dust because the molecular sieve material you would typically find the filters of course everywhere because of these this material will foul up the downstream uh, evaporators and the main cryogenic heat exchanger so if there is some problem yeah. you get a differential pressure across here that will start increasing okay and it might rest yeah. start restricting flow and the like down, okay. Downstream of the filter, we've got an emergency shutdown valve, ESDV. Yeah. Okay. And in case of interlock 500 tripping, and that yeah. valve will be closed. Oh, yeah. All right. Now we go down, and we're going to go through, and we're going to pull back here a little bit. 
Okay, so we came through this system, down through here, and now we're in past the filter and now coming into the, uh, the two chillers. So we have the medium pressure and the low pressure C3 chillers. So now, after we've removed all of our water in, the molecular, in, the, in this section, plus the molecular sieves, removed mercury and any kind of contaminants, uh, captured all the dust, now we can start really chilling down the feed gas. Okay, and that's done in these two, uh, started in these two, and then the gas is then sent to the scrub column. So at this point coming out of the, uh, the second evaporator in these, of these two, the low pressure evaporator, uh, we'll start, we'll have a, um, uh, our heavier com uh, hydrocarbons will have, uh, start condensed, will be in the liquid phase here. So we'll have condensed those in, as we go through these and getting that temperature. Okay. The yeah, but you didn't stop it. Mercury removal bed. I'm sorry? Uh, mercury removal bed you didn't show as such, huh? Oh I'm sorry, I didn't hear I, I couldn't I couldn't make that out. I gotta be speak a little louder. I... Mercury, mercury Oh removal. yes, the mercury, yes, the mercury's out, yes. And um, so at this point we yes. should have removed all of the bad components, bad compounds that should uh, you know, that would affect our operation, especially for with respect to fouling. And of course, you don't want mercury, not from a fouling point of view, we don't want it to be on our metals. You know, if you, uh, just a metallurgy too, we don't want you have a uh, mercury getting in there. And, and uh, so uh, giving us some, some uh, bad effect on our metallurgy over time, if we have too much mercury in there, for example. Yeah, that that's my question. We don't have a mercury bed in the PID. No, uh, you don't have a mercury what? You know, well, that's the yeah. The, the mercury removal um, could be done in the molecular sieves, but sometimes it's done in a separate filter. So we've just assumed that that's taken out in the in the molecular sieve area. Accepted. No, separately in all LNG, we have a bed that's filter and uh, is coming after the mercury bed. And molecular sieve is only exclusively to remove the water and mercury removal is a separate bed. Yes, As yes, such. right, yes. Yeah, we don't, we don't have that. What we're saying, what I'm saying is we're just assuming that uh, that will be done in that section. We're not, we're not, we haven't drawn that particular vessel. Okay, and uh, yes, we accept. Yeah. Right. Okay, so you know, and um, uh, uh, you know, the mercury effect is a long-term effect. You know, the, the simulator itself is. You know, this is very important uh, you know, to understand. The simulator itself is really okay. there to, to train it to train the the newer operators, in the and even exactly. experienced operators in the in the process operations. The longer the, the mercury is a type of effect which is a long-term effect. Of course, you know there is, is equipment that needs to be checked and op regularly, op you know, checked to make sure it's operating uh, properly. But the operator wouldn't see anything, you know, if, uh, uh, for that system. He wouldn't see anything on his instrumentation. There's nothing that would gross, you know, wouldn't affect the temperature or pressure. Uh, it would take a long. It would be a long-term effect. So those types of effects, yes, we recognize that in the process there is, there is equipment to deal with that. However, in this, on a simulator for training purposes where you're looking over a three-hour, four-hour, maybe one-day training period, that's, that's not going to come into play. So that's why you know, it tends to be simplified because we could, we could, we could, we could do a lot more uh, uh, presentation of that system and the like, but it would just take up space on the screen that we, we need to use for the other things. So, so we, we, we tend not to, as with any simulation, you tend to make some assumptions. And that's one of the assumptions okay. we've made. Okay. We got it. But it's a good point. It's a good point, you know, because it sets the philosophy of what's important to simulate, especially those things we have to worry about heat balance, material balance, energy balance. That's what the operator is responsible for doing, making sure that those things, those balances are, are being 
dynamic and going in the right way and that he wants to do uh, to maintain good process conditions. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So now we come out of the um, the the chiller, the uh, medium pressure and the low pressure. And of course, as we go lower in pressure, we go lower in temperature on the refrigeration. We get a lower temperature in the process, a corresponding temperature in the process. So these. Uh, evaporators, you can see down here, one of the mo uh, interesting things, one of the things I was saying before about the refrigeration system was the refrigerant here is supplied from this particular refrigerant, the medium pressure refrigerant, comes from an, another um, evaporator. You can see here, and this is the coming from a high pressure evaporator. And then that will come down and supply from the high pressure evaporator will uh, be extra liquid will be, will be pushed in there under level control. And then that liquid will then be routed down into the medium pressure, uh, in, into this uh, medium pressure evaporator. In the same, same way, this medium pressure evaporator also becomes the receiver for the low pressure uh, evaporators. So this has a dual function. It, it's, also, it's an evaporator, and it's also a receiver. So it's also the passing through refrigerant to continue on to the low pressure. Okay, and, and you'll see this all over in the process here. Okay, so we've we we take the from the high pressure re, uh, evaporator on P and ID six. We'll get to that when we get to P and ID six. Come down and we flash, come in. Uh, boil off, and we have excess material over what we boil off, and that excess material will go, uh, excess refrigerant liquid will then be used for these particular heat uh, evaporators. So for the low pressure on the feed gas chilling, and we also have a simulated a, um, on the deethanizer in the, plant, on the uh, in the natural gas liquids plant, we've simulated the load on the C3 refrigeration system. Uh, by uh, a heat input uh, that comes from another unit. So E60, E6, sorry, E801, I have to look at that more closely. Let me just zoom in here a little bit. 601. Okay, let's, let's zoom in here a little bit. The extended is 801, yeah. 801. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we can see here, right. This this is the deethanizer in the natural gas liquids plant. We don't actually simulate yeah. that unit. What we're doing is we're putting a, a heat load in. We're putting a heat load into this heat exchanger. Excuse me, which will cause evaporation of the refrigerant. So this is just another little complexity, and the heat duty in this heat exchanger is assumed proportional to how much liquid, how much, na uh, how much liquids we're producing at the bottom of the scrub column. So it's a, very, it's a simplified heat duty calculation. So we're just making it proportional to how much of the natural gas of the liquids we're producing in the bottom of the scrub column. So we just have that extra load in there just to make the balances correct on the refrigeration system to give it some extra um, realism. You can also see that this refrigerant will be uh, closed off in the event of a uh, shutdown. And also this here, a, uh, VZSD valves. VZSD. OK. And then, of course, there's uh, this go to the low pressure uh, evaporator here on the feed gas. And then there's a low pressure evaporator here. Uh, for the deethanizer, and then there's an additional low prep, uh, pressure evaporator, uh, the C3 in the E531, which uh, we'll see on the next page. Okay. So again, if it just remember this um, evaporator is also serving as the receiver for these one, two, three low pressure evaporators. All right. You can see it gets to be a little bit complicated for an operator to keep an eye on these. And during startup, you have to have a very, very good set of uh, observation skills to make sure that 
Uh, they're all being um, properly level controlled, and there's no problems with the, uh, the supply. And once you get into supply problems on the refrigeration systems, you're going to have a little bit of a trouble when you're operating. But, uh, that's what we have the simulator for, so that the these concepts can be practiced. Okay. And lastly, just one little extra. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. And then on a trip, we have a blowdown valve. Um, there's a blowdown system um, where valves can be opened up to depressure equipment. You'll see that the blowdown valves are marked BDV, blowdown valve, and that the shut uh, the isolation valves, emergency shutdown valve, will be ESDV. So by their tag, you'll understand their function. And the blowdown valves are to to to, to purge out, to, to depressure the system. We'll see later in the uh, interlock system, you cannot, de you cannot, you cannot open the blowdown uh, system unless you've actually isolated the system and shut, shut it down. So, but we'll get to that a little bit later on the, uh, on the functions there. OK? All right, any questions on this P and ID? Yeah, this BDV is permissive or automatic? I'm sorry? The BDV which you show to the player, yes, is it config is it configured as automatic uh, blowdown or permissive to blowdown? That's a good. It has to be done manually. And in fact, I'll show you. I'm going to skip ahead here to the to the interlock. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is the emergency blowdown interlock, and this shows um, the permissive is that the the emergency stop has to be activated first. So there's an emergency stop uh, interlock signal. And when it comes okay. in, yeah. this is a permissive. And when this permissive is set, okay. then you can trip and then you can you can open the, the blow down the blow down valves by using okay. this hand switch HS501. Okay? okay. So it's a it's it's manually done, but you have to there is it is interlocked so that you you just can't open it all of a sudden in the middle of the operation. You have to isolate it first and then then you can blow it down. OK, good question. Yes. All right, any more? Thanks, sir. All right. No, that's oh, no. OK. We'll go, yeah, go, to, we'll go to the next PNID, PNID number two. So at this point now, the, the feed gas has been chilled. We've taken the, all the, uh, the moisture out. We've chilled it down. We now have a two-phase stream. Of course, the methane is still mostly in the vapor phase uh, at this point from the chilled feed gas. You see we have another uh, shutdown valve here, so this will be isolated in case of a, an emergency uh, trip. The, um, this stream coming in, they will have some, the heavies will be in liquid phase and will make their way down to the bottom of the column. Of course, it will be fairly chilled. In the scrub column, the uh, you see the tray numbers here. It's actually not that large a column, not that complicated. It's just a uh, stripping rectification column. We're going to use steam, low pressure steam, as the uh, and a reboiler at the bottom, and we have a condensate pot to collect the steam from the reboiler, and then take that back off the battery limit. And these uh, are also uh, can be are tripped when it's tripped. These will be closed down. The uh, temperature in the scrub column at the, I believe it's on tray 15, will be controlled by uh, adjusting the steam rate in, giving us some more boil up uh, to adjust that temperature, to get to that, that particular temperature. There is an override loop, override selector, in case uh, this temperature becomes too cold. It will add heat. I believe that's how it works. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> well, it's described in the instructor manual. I'm trying to remember if the uh, if it's an override for if it becomes too cold. I believe that's what the case is. If the, the problem we can get to in this in this is if this this uh, this side becomes too cold, we can have freeze ups in the reboiler because this is steam. So if these these these. Uh, so what we want is if this becomes really cool, I believe the override is put more steam in. 
We don't want to have less steam, so this will add more steam. Uh, it's a high selector. Okay, that answers my question. I'm, yeah. I'm thinking aloud right now. <laughs> but it says that they're high selector. Yeah, it, it looks like it's a startup override. Startup override. Yeah. Probably. So when this cold start, you have to go for a low selector. And when it is in the normal operation, you have to go for the high selection. Yeah, so that normally this will be this will be in control and this won't. So the column. Yeah. But if this becomes too cold, it will ask for more more heat because we don't want any icing to occur in the reboiler. Okay? Yeah. And, then, and basically what we're trying to do in this column is we do have our liquid, our heavy liquids. We're trying to get a bit of a boil up so we can strip off the lighter material and push that back up the column. So we're doing some rectification here. Of course, in the top of the column, we're going to have some reflux. So it's a conventional you know, stripping column. We call the scrub column so we can scrub out the um, the, the heavy, um, the heavier um, hydrocarbons, and they are taken off under pressure control from the scrub column, and then taken off to the fractionation section at battery limit. And of course, we've got a level controller, direct level controller, flow indication, and then we have an isolation, an emergency shutdown valve here. Okay, very very kind of standard uh, distillation column. All right. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. OK, so that takes care of the bottom of the column. At the top of the column becomes a little more interesting. The top of the column, of course, it's a, as I mentioned, we're going to have a condenser. But you won't see a condenser drawn here. And the reason is our condenser is actually part of the main cryogenic heat exchanger. We we follow the overhead line, and we see the pressure controller uh, on the overhead line that will go back and reset our feed controller. So now we've got this gas flow being taken off from the top of the column. We can blow it down to the flare system, and then uh, taken off, and it goes to the main cryogenic heat exchanger. And there is a bypass around that service of that of the of the warm bundle. So the uh, so this goes in, and the main cryogenic heat exchanger. I'm going to skip to the next page. And here's our scrub column vapor coming in here. Go in. We have a filter. And then we're going to use some of this mixed refrigerant here to condense any kind of. Um, any of the heavier material that comes up there, maybe a little bit of the methane, I don't think so, but any of the heavier material will be ref then be refluxed back down and pushed back down into the, um, into the column. So that line uh, coming from the main cryogenic heat exchanger, we've got a bypass and we can regulate this temperature. This gives us a way to control the uh, amount of heat taken out. So if we by opening this, we'll push we'll less. will go to the bundle, and we can then keep this temperature under control. Uh, um, so we get, uh, affect the uh, proper con uh, a, a desired condensing rate, if we will, to keep that uh, keep that on uh, specification. So now we're coming back. We any condensate will be refluxed. Total. This is a total reflux. We're not producing any top product here. What we're trying to do here is just take any of our heavier materials that we condense at the top, and we're just going to take them, collect them under level control. We're just going to reflux them right back down the column. We don't want them up here. That's what we're doing with this with this here. So anything that comes up should be uh, uh, methane making its way through net gas. Should come should be methane coming out of here, mostly methane, and all of the heavier compounds should be. Refluxed, should be a little reboil, real rectification, and then push those heavier comp compounds back out the bottom. Okay, and there's no there's no top product taken off as a liquid, unlike a, a conventional stripper, for example. What we want is we have all gas coming off, and that will be our uh, our, our our natural gas that we want to um, 
sent to the main cryogenic heat exchanger so we can liquefy it. Okay, so we've got here two pumps, uh, two, the, two reflux pumps, and they can operate one or both. Normally there's only one in operation, or reflux that. We also, just in case we want to, instead of refluxing the material, we have the option of uh, taking the reflux material, uh, any 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 liquids in here, and we can actually push them forward into the gas line and send them into the main cryogenic heat exchanger. It's normally not normally not done, but we may want to do that to empty the uh, empty this out. Under certain conditions, we may want to push that forward and down uh, with the uh, the LNG. But we mainly want to recover the heavier compounds so we can distill them separate them, and then use them for chemical feedstocks, for example. Uh, they're more valuable that way than as a fuel. Right? So the preferred option is to push all those back down and out to the, uh, the NGL plant. OK. One last thing is we have a little flare uh, system off here to flare. We have the blowdown. Uh, line which opens that we saw on the interlock logic. We have a switch for that. Another blowdown valve that comes off the reflux drum. Okay, and no. we also have a hand controller. We can manually open this uh, this line to flare. Normally, don't want to do that, but we can. We can use that to depressure the column slowly. We want to do a blowdown. Uh, we can. We can also use the blowdown system to depressure. So we do have an option of, of manually uh, depressuring this system. Okay. Yeah. And that is hand control valve BDB five two three. This is snap valve or uh, hand control or BDB only for the purpose of uh, complete fast depressurization. This one here. BDB five two three. Yes. Yeah. This one, this one here, right? Yes. Yeah, that's that's done. That's, that's that's under control of interlock five zero one, which is the uh, interlock I showed you by skipping ahead. So there's a switch for that. So that's manually done using the hand switch from the interlock. And then this yeah, this works in parallel. This is this in giving the operator a little more flexibility in the operation of when he may want to vent vent off. Oh, good. Very good. Okay, understood. All right. So we've got the interlocks also, 502-503. Yes. And then there are interlocks. We'll get into the interlocks later about the um, uh, the scrub column. The scrub column has its own interlock, Thank too. You. OK. Thank you. Thank right. OK, any other questions on this? this no. We we have given uh, and the analyzer AI and PI 521 522 C5 plus a period 521 AI analyzer indicator right for the um, it is just an indication or yeah just an uh, indication which is indicating anything that's C5 and above the content in the gas here. So if you're not refluxing it, if you're having a poor poor condensation for whatever, you'll see the C5 plus will read high. Normally that's very low. In fact, let me just go and see what it is actually in the in the simulation. Here's our scrub column. And uh, normally it's around it's at zero. If you see where my I'm pointing to. So if we had any kind of breakthrough of the C5, you would see that. We don't want C5s for the reasons that they'll be just like water. They will, they will, they might be you. You know, you you can you can have real trouble in the uh, main cryogenic heat exchanger with heavier compounds. Okay. So no logic, no logic connected to it. Just it's only an indication. Yes, only it's an indication. Coming. If it's if it gets if it gets above zero, if he sees some kind of reading, he's he the the op, It's an indication the operator is going to have some trouble. Uh, at this point, so get an alarm, and then you have to. Whoa, hey, what's you have to think? Mm, how do I? What is my problem here? Right. 
Yeah. So yeah, yeah. If he loses reflux, for example, that would likely increase a bit, you know. For sure. Well yeah. Okay. All right, good question. All right. You have to know all the controls. And um, this kind of detail is, is put in the instructor manual, you know, the for monitoring, you know, to check that, double check some things. Yeah. But good, good question. Good question. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. We'll go on. The next, we're going to go to the heart of the process now, which is the main cryogenic heat exchanger. You see, we've got the, uh, I guess we call those the warm and the uh, cool and the cold bundles. Um, we discussed already the this service the, and the warm bundle is used for as the excuse me as the condenser for the scrub column and the additional services we have we have also uh, LPG reinjection from the um, from the fractionation section so we can set this uh, rate and uh, the LPG will then be chilled prior to because this is relatively warm compared to the main cryogenic heat exchanger. So there is the, um, this is a low pressure C3 refrigeration to chill this stream down a bit more. Okay, so we have a little bit of refrigeration for that. And then we'll chill the LPG a bit more. We'll go through a filter and push that in going through the warm, the middle and the cold end. And that will actually mix with our uh, our vapor coming from the scrub column, our net vapor coming this way and go through a filter, go through the middle, we'll get a lot of chilling in here and then we go through a pressure control valve, we're going to control this pressure down, bring the pressure down on this, once we get some liquid we're going to control our pressure down essentially and then we're going to chill it some more in the in the top section. So these two bundles are really doing the job right here of condensing the LNG from uh, down to, you know, condensing it make, and liquefying it. Okay? Yeah. And that's, that's where the, the bulk of the work is done. The, the liquefied natural gas is taken out at this point and then sent over for flash, uh, uh, for flashing. To get the nitrogen removal, to get any of the uh, you know, the uh, uh, nitrogen, gas off. nitrogen gas off. Okay, the um, the other services in here, of course, you have the um, the LPG reinjection comes in in the warm bundle and into the middle. This is a much smaller stream, of course, as we saw from the original. If we remember the flow rates, they we looked at about an uh, at the beginning. You know, it's a relatively smaller stream from a mass basis, so it's not as not as uh, large as stream. So this is also intermixing. So this is going to chill down because it's going to eventually end up mixing with the LNG. So the this bundle and this bundle, these two bundles, are going to absorb heat. These two guys, one of these is going to give up heat. I'm just going to have to figure out which one of those it is. That's this one. This is the guy who's giving uh, absorbing the heat or in this these two bundles of the mixed refrigerant. The mixed refrigerant vapor you can see coming in here. This coming is actually a vapor stream. Will actually absorb. Will actually uh, give up heat. So we, it's trying to be chilled down. So then it can auto refrigerate eventually at the top and do the uh, the Jewel Thompson valve. Anyway, so so here's our main our main line here. Our liquefaction pressure control just to let the pressure down so we don't want to have a large pressure we want to do a we're doing a uh, one pressure drop here then we're going to do another pressure drop another pressure drop at the outlet here with downstream we'll show you we'll actually jump ahead here a little bit into the uh, the LNG from the main cryogenic heat exchanger we'll have another uh, pressure drop across this valve and eventually now then flashing gas off here and then taking the liquid liquefied LNG out from the pumps and sending that off to storage to the storage tanks. So there's two pressure letdowns here and here. Okay. 
And if we look here, also, we have the temperature coming from the main cryogenic heat exchanger. As you can see here, there are uh, the, um, the temperature controller here is adjusting the flow rate, that's the, the total flow rate that's being taken off to the flash here. So the way that the, the plant capacity control works is this temperature controller will set the throughput of the LNG through the whole plant, this guy right here. Right. Sorry. This guy right here, the TIC 541. Let me just go over here. And it's adjusting the what it's what it's doing is it's it's adjusting the total rate coming from the main cryogenic heat exchanger. And that temperature, as you increase the flow rate, this temperature will increase. Because what's happening is as we draw more flow out of here, that will cause this pressure in the, the pressure in this line to decrease. When the pressure in a line decreases here, this pressure controller it will decrease. This pressure controller will then try to bring more flow in this way from the scrub column. So as more flow is pulled from the scrub column, the scrub column pressure will drop, and then the uh, feed gas uh, flow controller will increase the feed, if that's the case with the temperature. So if we put more material through the main cryogenic heat exchanger, how will its outlet temperature change? It will increase, because this has a, the main cryogenic uh, heat exchanger has a uh, a particular uh, duty, uh, a particular heat heat transfer capability and duty, based on how the mixed refrigeration system is running, and it's running at a particular speed, particular settings for the uh, some of these uh, controls in here, which we'll go over. Then that will be fixed. So the the flow rate will by heat balance will will affect the um, uh, uh, the the heat balance will affect the temperature based on the flow rate. The, the 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 temperature will be affected by the heat balance there. So that control loop, again, the, the this control loop, this temperature controller, will control this flow until this 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 temperature controller is satisfied. And so it will increase flow as it increase if it increases flow, the temperature here will increase. If it decreases the flow, this temperature will decrease. And this temperature controller will find the right flow rate to satisfy the set point here. And that set point is around, let's see what it is here on the, here, I want minus 149 degrees. If we actually come down here, here's the actual uh, temperature controller in the simulator. And it's controlling. Uh, 416.7 tons an hour uh, in, the, in the steady state condition. Okay, and so we go back, and that part, that's still I'm showing you now the, on the on the simulator. That's this line, and that comes back to this pressure controller. This is at 19 bar. This will draw out from the uh, the scrub column, and the scrub column's operating at 56 bar. So our pressure drop goes 56 bar. Do, 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 do. out through here, down, down to 19 bar. This is all liquefied at this point at 19 bar. And then finally, it's, uh, it's coming out at minus 149. And then this pressure in this drum goes around and comes. What is the pressure in this drum? Pressure in this drum is 1.20 bar right here. OK? And that's the, uh, the design conditions. OK. Any questions on the capacity control of the unit? Anybody? Yeah. Lord. 
Okay, go ahead. <laughs> you can ask. No, yeah, it's, it, it, it takes a little while. It actually took me, uh, uh, when I was learning the process, it took me a little while for it to sink in, the, the concept. But the, 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 main, the, the main thing you have to understand is that the main cryogenic heat exchanger, it's a, it's a um, capacity to remove heat will set what the throughput of the plant will be. So you actually, when you change the refrigeration system, all the controls will respond in, in to it. So if I went, for example, I changed the speed on the mixed refrigerant compressor, if I change the circulation flow, I'm going to change essentially how much heat I can remove from the main cryogenic heat exchanger. Once I do that, that affects what temperature comes out of the main cryogenic heat exchanger for a given flow rate of uh, LNG through it, a given liquefaction rate. So if I decrease the speed on the mixed refrigerant compressor, I'm asking to remove less heat. When I ask to remove less heat, the outlet temperature on the main cryogenic heat exchanger, the LNG temperature, will go up. When the LNG temperature goes up, it says, oh, the, the temperature controller, which is down here, will say, hey, don't take so much flow because I've got to keep the temperature down at, you know, what, what my set point is minus 149. So it will then say, okay, we're going to take less flow out here, and then the controls bump, everybody bumps backwards. This pressure gets affected because the, the rate changes. It, it, it opens, uh, in the case of when we slow it down, it's, this pressure is going to go up. So this, this valve is going to close, so it doesn't have as much flow going in, and the pressure will drop. When it doesn't have as much flow, the, the scrub column pressure will go up. When the scrub column pressure goes up, it will ask for less feed gas. So when you actually run the simulator, you'll see this. You can play with it once you, you know, you've got it you know, there. You can start making some changes. And what I would recommend to really understand it is to make a change to the uh, mixed refrigerant uh, compressor. Make a 50 RPM change and see what happens. We increase it or decrease it by 50 or 100 RPM. And you can then start observing and looking at the trends on the, on the simulator and you'll begin to see how they understand how the controls work. But it takes a little bit of, of looking at it and understanding it, but those are the essential controls that uh, the, the operator will have to pay attention to. And those are the ones that make the whole process go. After that, you've got level controllers, and you've got some reflux flow controllers and, and temperature controllers. But those are the main controls that really make the, the whole process go. And that's really what I you know, want to get to here. OK? So Yeah, you are explaining to us in, in the form of cascading or on the you know, normal operating. Is it on the cascade way we are telling? or in the individual equipment, manual startup to the full load conditions. Which way you are explaining now? Well, I mean, in the normal condition. In other words, if there's a, if the operator, if he's just running steadily, right, he's got a steady set of conditions. And what typically happens in LNG units, especially those that are being pushed to their limit, is, of course, you get the, the temperature changes during the day. And you may get some, um, you know, some effects on how well you can exhaust heat. So at nighttime you can you can remove some more heat yeah. faster. During the day you have less. And actually what will happen is with that limit, you know, with the the ambient temperature changing, it will actually affect the how much throughput you can get through the um, uh, through the unit. Because it affects the refrigeration system and then the refrigeration system affects how much condensing you can do in the main cryogenic heat exchanger and those controls. So we're talking at, you know, around the steady, around the normal operation is what I'm talking about. Right. Okay. And that's yeah. better. I mean, it is not on, it is not on cascade, but better to run on auto mode. Well, you know, well, there is a, all the yeah. controllers in auto mode. Well, there is a cascade. The, the cascade, if you look here at the temperature to, to flow cascade, that's one of the cascades. But the, yeah. But the other throughput occurs because the, the, as this flow rate changes, it's, it's a, it's, if, if you will, it's, it's not a cascade. It's a, it's, the process is affected. So as you change the flow rate coming out here, it affects, yeah. this, it affects this pressure. 
As this pressure is affected, it changes this valve, which changes how much material comes in and out of the scrub column. As a scrub column, as it change, you change the material coming in and out of the scrub column, this overhead pressure changes, and then it goes back to the feed gas. So they, they all work. They're, they're not in direct cascade, but they're all affected through the process okay, by changing the flow rate. When the flow rate changes, the pressures change. And then this pressure controller at the top of the scrub column then changes back to the feed gas. But it, it takes a little bit, you know, you have to, you know, become fam very familiar with the, the, the concepts. And when you, when you finally get to see it and you go, oh, okay, now I understand it. And then you can, then of course, when you, when you see it, you can try to train others in the concepts. But it does take a little bit of time to, um, to, to see it all working because, you know, be, your, your concepts here now are, okay, I know how this works and how this works and how this works, but wait a second. <laughs> you'll, you'll say, how, did, how does the flow rate change? <laughs> and you have to go back through the pressure controllers. It bumps through the pressure controllers. That's the, that's the main point. At the end of it is a flow controller. Okay. All right? uh, and changing many, this flow changes those two pressures. And then those two pressures respond by changing the feed gas pressure. That's basically how it works. And that's, wow. But they'll, they'll all change together. None, none of them are isolated. They're actually through the process. They'll all affect each other, either in a forward way yes. or in a reverse way, because they're all connected in the, in the whole um, network of the, 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 the pressure and the flow count, the flow uh, system. OK? Yeah. But the what I want to know is how many controllers are having a manual auto and cascade mode? How many are on cascade? Oh, you know, I don't, I don't know that offhand, but you know, that's, that's a very good exercise for you to do by highlighting those on the P and ID. <laughs> I, I don't know the, I don't know the answer, but you can, you can just look at the P and IDs and see all of the, uh, uh, of the cascades. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Okay. Excellent. Uh, you, know, you bring up a good point now, you, a good question. So, for example, if you're looking on P and ID number four here, okay, I'm going to zoom in a little bit, and there's another cascade loop, which is interesting. I'll just zoom out a little bit. You know, the main this is the, the main uh, cascade loop is this TIC to FIC 541, and this will set the total throughput of the plant. Uh, the LNG liquefaction rate. Okay. However, there's another TIC here, which normally is not in automatic. Okay. But you can use this as a. Well, what happens is if, if for whatever reason, the uh, the LNG pumps are out of service, going to tankage, you can use this bypass line, and not use and not flash use the flash gas, but you can take this directly to tank. So. This is normally not in operation. This this uh, this line is not normally in service. But in case there's some problems with this system or with the compressor, you can't you can't take the gas off, uh, flash it off, and take it off with the compressor. Say the compressor is shut down, and you don't want to flare it. So what you can do is you can take this off and take it directly to tankage. Okay. So there's okay, a there's, there's that, a that means that line will be always cool conditions. Is that right? Right. For having it to bypass, there must be a small amount of flow to keep it cool and, you know, when you cascade this line. Yeah, and so... this line, uh, that, that should be cool as well. So this is one of the cascades which you are telling about. Yeah, but the, this cascade is not normally in service, but it's a backup, you know, you use it as a backup, for example. Um, what you can do is just look at the P and IDs. You can go through that, and as an exercise, I would recommend to uh, to take a look at that and and to become familiar with those. Okay, but yeah. this is the 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 important concept here that I want to go back over again is is just how the the main cryogenic heat exchanger and it, how it how it operates affects the throughput of the the unit and through these controls through the the temperature to flow. Then once the flow is adjusted, it adjusts the pressure here, and then as this valve opens and closes, it t takes adjusts the takeoff rate, which then affects the scrub column pressure, and the scrub column pressure asks for more or less feed gas. So 
depending upon which direction the, the change is going of the flow rate. Okay? And it's, like I said, it's not too obvious. Okay, and then, um, so, so, so that's how we, um, so that's mainly, you know, how it all gets done in the process of liquefaction and how it's actually regulated to a certain rate. And we can look at the additional details of the mixed refrigerant system and of the C3 refrigeration system and of the, uh, the, the gas compressor, the fuel gas compressor nitrogen rejection system. Okay? Yeah. All right. So the and the main. So um, any other questions on the on the main cryogenic heat exchanger? We're going to come back to this because we're going to talk about the mixed refrigerant system. That's the other side of this. So that's okay. actually what's you know providing the chilling. And we're we'll get into this okay. when we we discuss the mixed refrigerant system. Okay. So we'll come back okay. here. If you have some questions on that side, we'll come back here. I'll explain that. But if you have anything on the on the process side, on the LNG side, any uh, thing. Okay. All right. So after after we liquefy, go through the main cryogenic heat exchanger, go through that pressure controller down, back past the cascade. Now we have our um, our LNG flash drum. So this is operating about 1.2 bar. And uh, there are two pressure controllers here. One is for flare, in case we have a problem with the, the compressor over here. This gas that's coming off the flash drum would be, uh, actually what happens here is that this line, the flash gas is very cold. And so the, this line is actually sent to a heat exchanger here. Uh, and this heat exchanger actually to recover the cooling, if you will, to recover the cold from this gas is used to um, to cool down uh, vapor, mixed refrigerant vapor, that then is uh, condensed here. So some some of the mixed refrigerant vapor is cooled partially. I believe it's partially condensed. If I if I if I if I remember correctly, I'm not sure if this is mixed refrigerant vapor from that's circulating, and then it's used to uh, it cools down in this exchanger. And this is the flash gas coming off, going in here, and then returning uh, back here. And there's a temperature controller on here so that this uh, tries to take um, as much mixed refrigerant vapor in here that this heat exchanger will, will, uh, will provide chilling to. <laughs> so they provide heat to the temperature controller here to, to just adjust this rate so it doesn't uh, take too much, for example. You don't want to take too much mixed refrigerant vapor here because this cannot get too warm here for the mixed refrigerant vapor. So, But anyway, so the, the flash gas comes through here. We recover some of that chill. Okay, it heats up. And then that stream is now taken off and brought here. And it's either going to be compressed in the gas compressor, okay, the fuel gas compressor, or it's going to be taken off and flared in case of an override from this pressure controller, okay. And the the gas compressor, it's four stages. Uh, it's pretty simple operation actually. It looks more complicated than it is. It pretty much runs automatically. You, uh, it's a motor driven. A compressor. Uh, there is a throttling valve for the pressure control on the suction. There is a mechanical stop. I'll just zoom in there a little bit. We have a mechanical stop. Excuse me while I adjust this a little bit. And we have a split range. This is a mechanical stop so that you cannot close this too, too much. This is just to get some fine, you know, some rough control of the flow rate uh, going through the compressor. And the other part of this split range will control, uh, will open up the bypasses. There is a uh, anti-surge control system and capacity control. And uh, this is a bias in here. And what this signal will do is 
in case the pressure is getting too low, we'll open up the recycle lines. These are the recycle, I don't know why that, that line came out that way, but the recycle lines on the, um, uh, the two stages, the high, the high and the low pressure stages. When you open the recycle lines, you reduce the net capacity of the, of the total compressor. Okay, so there's, it's a, on the split range. So you're trying to throttle first, and if you can't do that, then it will open up the, the, the bypasses. Okay, so the first priority is to, is to throttle this. The second priority is to open the backup, the bypasses, and that's the way the control, control is tuned. And this is the summer because we also have an anti-surge that's also trying to open these bypasses just in case there's a minimum flow for these. And so these two anti-surges on the compressor will go here. Okay. And try to open these kickback valves. Okay. Um, and this is pretty straightforward, just a four stage. Like I said, it's a very simple, you know, straightforward machine. It doesn't take too much to operate it other than turn on the motor. Uh, make sure your anti-surge controllers are in auto. They should always be in auto, but just double check that. And um, and that's pretty much it. If there's some problems with it, with some temperatures, some alarms, then you know, you'd have to address that, see what maybe the problem is, maybe a very high differential pressure for some reason across the compressor. And then the, the flash gas is taken off here through the compressor, up, down, up, down, through, up, down, up, down, essentially four stages, and then out to the fuel gas system. Okay, and then the flow is indicated over here. And you have all your other pressure and temperature controls on here. All right, any questions on the, the gas flow? The flash gas? Oops. And this is called, go ahead. Uh, it's a conventional one and flash compressor, right? Yep. And uh, the load variation, uh, we have steady RPM, right? I'm sorry? It's, it's a motor operated and flash compressor, correct? Yeah, it's a motor operated, so it runs at a constant speed. Constant speed. Electric motor operated. The load variation. Oh, Yes. Sorry. The the configuration when the pump trips when you have it, we have the compressor will not be running at them. Right? We have the two pumps here P five four one A B. Mm-hmm. Running by bypass yep. motor. Your LNG pumps pumping the tank is right. Yeah. yeah. What will be the LNG flash during the time when we are using the you know, as we said about uh, LNG passing through, bypassing the vessel, uh -huh. V541. Yes, and you were bypassing that, right. So let's say that the compressors shut down. And you still want to run LNG uh -huh. out to the tanks. Yes. So now, now what's going to happen is you're going to get flashing in the storage tanks. So instead of instead oh, yeah. of flashing occurring in this drum because you're bypassing it, the flashing will then take place out in the storage uh, the storage tank, and that's something you have to be concerned about. It's we don't have the storage tank uh, simulated, but there will be flashing in the the um, in the tanks of the the vapor. Um, yes, there may be there is there is of course a um, a boil off gas compressor so that yes. that will increase the boil off rate will increase and then however that's if that's actually you know compressed and sent to the fuel gas system it'll do that or else if it's used for uh, transfer you know it'll do that oh, yeah. too so that would be that flashing effect would have to be managed at the tankage at tankage but it's a good question because what happens now? You're not taking that gas off. It's got to, it's going somewhere. Yes, it's going down that line. It's going to tankage, and that would have to be addressed in the in the in the in the tank section. 
good question. Yes. Thank you. But there's nothing the operator of the LNG can do directly on that. He can just say, oh, hey, you can just let, let somebody know, hey, look, I'm running a bypass on here. You're going to get some more gas if somebody else is, you know, uh, in charge of the tanks. But uh, during that time, the compressor will be running, right? And flash compressor will be running. I'm sorry, what will be, oh, during that time, what will be happening? Yes, the, the boil-off gas compressor should be running, yeah. Otherwise, you have to flare. Oh, yeah. That's your last resort is to flare. That's one thing you don't want to do because it's a loss of product. You know, oh, yeah. you don't, and of course, you don't want to have the, the plant manager seeing the flare, you know, lit, lit off. And it's, that's not, not really good for operations. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, but it has to be managed. That's the, uh, the the last resort is to flare it. So, now one my try question to avoid is, that. You know, in, in the second stage K five zero zero two, there is a valve, and if you see, there is an outlet and given to the valve instead of uh, what is the configuration says. I'm sorry. Which valve? Uh, K5002, K500, bottom most wall, anti surge wall. Kick back, kick back. Yeah, this one, kick back, bottom. These valves? Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, how it is connected, you see, it is. Uh, yeah. Kick back. Uh, yeah, this, 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 the line is, is off for some reason. I don't know, I don't know why. But anyway, um, the, um, these valves, how are they operated? Connected. Oh, yeah. connected. You see, it's connected on the self-acting light. Instead of giving, is it a wrong in the drawing? I'm sorry. I, I speak up a little bit. I, I I couldn't make quite make out what you asked. Can you ask him why it is connected? Yeah. Uh, he the question is like why the connection is shown like this. What, in, over in here. The, in the drawing. Yes. Ah, yeah. Yes. Oh, that's a mistake. I, I, I printed this today, and uh, for some reason I, I was using Visio, and I, I printed this to a file, and it made some kind of error in Visio. So I'm sorry, I didn't see that until now. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's just supposed to go to the valve. Okay, okay. It's just, it's just some, some problem in Visio. I, I didn't see it. So. Okay. Well, let, me, let me see if it's in Visio. <laughs> I'll, get I'll, I'll actually show you. <laughs> Sometimes it's self-actuating, you know, <laughs> I kick back one. <laughs> Let's check it in Visio. Um, somewhere in here. That's in another page. Oh, it's like that. Somehow the game, that's yeah, fixed now. Okay. ID number four, right? <laughs> oh, come on. You're watching me change a, a graphic. This is only temporary. Yeah. Yes, we are getting it. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's fixed now. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, sir. Sorry, huh? <laughs> I couldn't get it. I thought it was <laughs> All right, it was just uh, some problem in Visio. Okay, so that's corrected now. Okay, thanks. Right, thank you. No, welcome. Yeah, and this, like I said, the the these kickback valves work in 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 the pressure controller and the uh, anti surge. Either of these, the will will open up the valves. And you'll notice that this is a summer. Uh, it's a little, you might say, well, why don't you just put in a high selector? But a high selector actually um, would not give you a, the best control, considering you want to do pressure control and anti-surge control at the same time. So if you use a summer and these signals are calling for the valve to be open more and more and more, for the anti-surge, it's always safe to open the valve more, so you can use a summer. 
And that way, even when the anti-surge is trying to regulate this valve, it allows the pressure controller to directly even open the valve more by summing it as opposed to doing a high selector. So a summer is used in this case. And that's my design. <laughs> so, and it improved the control, so the, uh, makes it a smoother, smoother operating control. OK? OK, so that's the. The selector switch here, the high and low selector switch here, which are in this frame. For summer, uh, summer there is one. You know, when you switch over for summer and, uh, you know, uh, or ambient temperature, when you said summer, we have a selector switch, uh, X, Y. Where's that? No, how will we select uh, the summer when you write it as summer? Oh, you don't. You don't have to select it. It's automatic. It's actually just. It just uh, the sums. Oh, yeah. It sums the two signals up, so that if oh, it is not summer. summer. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's okay. automatic. It will sum the two signals up, and this is a split range. Okay. So the this signal will come in uh, only. It will be. It will be zero as long when this valve is fully. When this valve hits 50% opening or closing, I should say, when it closes the 50%, after that, this this will try then to open the kickback valve so that it'll reduce the the total flow rate out through the two through the compressor. So it just sums it in here along with the anti-surge. And as I said, the summer is safe because because when you're trying to open the kickback valves, you, it's always a safer mode of operation. So by opening the valves more is always a safer mode of operation. So the, the pressure controller can get in there and say, OK, the anti-surge wants that kickback valve at 20%, let's say. But the pressure controller says, I want it at 30%. So it adds 10% to the signal. That's OK. That's safe. The 30% opening is safer than 20% opening on the kickback valve. So there's, it's, 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 it's continuous and automatic. There's no, um, there's no you don't have to do any uh, manual switching. Okay. okay. There is no control over it. And normally this anti surge will be closed at full load, right? That's correct. That's correct. Not, never. But, yeah. Uh, you know whether some opening will be always there for the kickback, always or. Uh, Actually, we have a part open. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Two to yeah. three percent. Okay, I got it. Oh. All right. That's actually All right. Okay. A load variation. So it's doing capacity control that way. It's actually using it's actually using the kickbacks for capacity control in this situation. Okay, that's just the way it's uh, set up. All right. Okay. And we show if you see that we uh, you notice we, we have the signal on here the uh, uh, the summer signal is indicated here mm -hmm. the recycle valve position so it's actually open in this case okay yeah this 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 uh, the compressor the, re the the gas compressor it's, it's highly variable if you change the flash pressure for example lower it a little bit you can very easily over you know uh, close the recycle valves to get more capacity. So so it, it, it covers a very wide range of uh, gas uh, flow rates. OK. No, OK. Yeah. All right. So um, and just to complete this, of course, we mentioned the, the LNG being uh, uh, pumped out to tankage. And we have the bypass valve on here and these two, this secondary temperature flow control. This will work exactly the same as the other one. It's just working on a different stream. OK. Yeah. And that's that. And then your indication, your total uh, flow to tankage is indicated out here. OK, so that basically covers the process side of LNG through the main cryogenic yes. heat exchanger, the scrub column, and the, the, the feed gas cooling and uh, dehydration. OK. What's left is we have the mixed refrigerant uh, 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 system. 
and we have the propane refrigerant system left, yeah. and then the two interlock two interlocks. Okay. Now uh, the mixed refrigerant system, um, of course, it consists of uh, a mixture of gases. Uh, as we can see here, it's the uh, nitrogen. Let me just get this over here. It's normally running in a cl it's a closed system. No, excuse me. But we can bring in at any time. We can add more nitrogen. We can add methane, which is a scrub com uh, is derived from the scrub column. We can add ethane, and we can add propane. As you, as you see here, nitrogen and ethane come from the battery limit of the simulation. However, you can see that the methane, the scrub column, uh, comes from the scrub column, and the propane comes from V603, which I'm pretty sure is the receiver. Let's see where that is on, on PNIV6. V603 is from here. Okay, so we can bring in some gas off. This is vapor. And there's a line and uh, somewhere there's a takeoff here from from here. From V603. We have to find a line to the mixed refrigerant somewhere. Isn't there somewhere in there? Oh, here it is. There's a takeoff line here. And that goes to the uh, mixed refrigerant system. Okay, so when we want C3, we'll bleed it off the, um, we'll take it out of the propane refrigeration system. And this is important. The um, when you're running and you're actually during startup, for example, and you're uh, adding propane, you'll actually have to take propane out of the, the propane refrigeration system. And when you do that, you have to bring more propane in from battery limit to to, to add uh, because levels will start to go down in the uh, uh, in the receiver in the propane system. The level in the uh, what do they call this? The V six O four is referred to as accumulator. The accumulator level just floats, and as you draw um, propane out from here. From just on the suction of the high pressure stage, you take propane out. Yeah. That will eventually that that be that will be uh, will draw this level down. We'll draw the level down in this um, in V six o four. How about the pen pump work? Huh? Sorry. So it must be propane pump. I'm sorry. I had a little interference. I didn't hear that. No problem. Proceed. Proceed. Yeah. Well, what's important is that these, because of these, these are actually these are actually connections to other parts of the uh, simulator, uh, to other parts of the systems in the simulator, simulating the system, that they're interactive. So when you take, oh, I want to bring some propane in. You're not in that case. You're not bringing it from battery limit. You're pulling it out of the this the the, the, pro, the C3 refrigeration system. And you'll have to actually make adjustments to that. So the the simulator has a lot of the realism in terms of the, the real units are like that. So when you make a move, when you when you make an adjustment to the C3, uh, to the mixed refrigeration system by adding more propane, you're also going to have to make an adjustment to the C3 refrigeration system to, to bring some more propane into that from, from battery limits. OK? Um, and also, the, the system has to be running. So the C3 refrigeration system has to be running to bring C3 into the mixed refrigeration system. So there's also, you know, that aspect of the realism of it. Okay, because um, it's not coming in from battery limit, and that's what I want to point out that some of these connections down here are actual real are dynamic. These are not battery limits; they're actually dynamic connections. So if that system isn't operating, so for example, if the scrub column we don't have it pressured up with and have methane, you know, in there. Uh, you're not going to get methane coming in here. So you have to have enough pressure to push in the methane in here. Uh, same thing for yeah. the, the propane. 
if you don't have pressure in that system, it's not operating, you won't get any flow in here. Okay. Now, on the ethane and the nitrogen are battery limits, so they will have the pressure. Yeah. We have a propane storage, you know, generally. Propane makeup, propane makeup. Yeah, yeah. There is in the in the in the C3 system, um, in the C3 refrigeration system, there is a makeup line for that. Um, that's from that's here. If we look on the C3, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but that's okay because we're answering questions, so that's good. No, oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, we are not getting actually. It is tapping from the uh, propane compressor. There is a line coming back uh, to the. Uh, propane or the makeup system is only going to the propane only. Right? Yeah. Well, in the in the simulator, it's it's a battery limit here, uh, on the yeah. right here. You see that they're from storage. So that's where the operator will have to open the valve and and bring more you know bring more propane in and make sure that the the level on the uh, on the accumulator will you know is is maintained not too high, not too low. Okay. Oh yeah, but, I got it. But it's it's good. It's a good. Tr you know, it's it's it becomes very interesting during training. I mean, uh, you know, I had to verify the model, do all the operations, write all the procedures, and um, it gets to be challenging sometimes. You forget that they're. Oh yes, I'm taking this from over here, and there there are effects, and and that's what I'm pointing out. I'm I'm pointing out that there's there's a um, um, a lot of connections in the in the in the simulator that are realistic, and then you have to. You know, you, you, you move one thing, you have to worry about uh, affecting another another unit. So, yeah. and I'm just pointing out this is one of them. Yes. Okay? Yes. 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 Okay, so anyway, Thank it's you. good. Any other questions? And we'll go over the, I'll go over the mixed refrigerant system. No, no. Uh, proceed, proceed. Okay. Now, the mixed refrigerant system, I'm going to come back here a little bit. Um, we're, uh, we're looking at the green line here. So the mixed refrigerant vapor is returning from the main cryogenic heat exchanger. So this is uh, basically the outlet of all the mixed refrigerant. It gets mixed on the shell, shell side of the, and finally comes out the bottom, and then it gets passed back uh, to this point. And we'll, we'll, we will go back to the main cryogenic heat exchanger by going forward first. <laughs> so we'll go through the compressors, and then we'll end up back at the main cryogenic heat exchanger and discuss those valves over there. So, so we'll, we're taking the vapor uh, return from the main cryogenic heat exchanger. It's relatively warm. Of course, warm is a relative. You know, warm is it's very cold uh, in in actuality, but it's it's relatively warm compared to the other temperatures. Okay, we have a knockout drum. Uh, up, yeah. Uh, it did not get any liquids that might be coming in and through various various ways. Then the uh, the gas, the knockout gas is then taken into the first stage. Okay, and we actually have this is a helper motor up here, and that's normally not running, but you can use it at startup. We have a gas turbine. It's the gas turbine drive is very uh, is simulated. Uh, very simplified. We don't have much detail on the uh, the gas turbine. Just have fuel gas coming in, and there's some gas turbine exhaust. And for some reason, my gas turbine exhaust line didn't get drawn, <laughs> but on this on this diagram, but it should be on yours. Um, uh, so we have a very simplified gas turbine uh, drive, but we have a speed controller. So now we can adjust the operating speed of the mixed refrigerant uh, compressors. We have two stages. In the first stage, of course, we have compression. And then we have a cooling water exchanger. This uses uh, cooling or seawater. And then after that, we go into a, uh, a uh, subcooled, we're using subcooled C3 refrigerant, and we're returning it to the high pressure stage. So we're doing additional heat removal by using an, a, a, a high pressure uh, uh, evaporation of C3, of the uh, propane refrigeration refrigerant. Okay, and that's connected in from uh, 
one of the other um, evaporators. Okay. Subcooled yep. refrigerant from the okay yeah that's actually coming off the C3 refrigeration system. Okay, that's not it's just coming off the um, the accumulator, the C3 accumulator, and has this, another cooler on it. Okay, so that's coming in here. There's level control on the refrigerant side, and then the yeah. ref, uh, it's returned back to the C3 refrigeration compressor high pressure stage. So now the mixed refrigerant, this mixture of nitrogen, methane, ethane, and propane, now compressed, cooled with cooling water, chilled with um, C3 refrigerant, and now goes through and then goes through another knockout drum for the second stage. At this point, we should not have any, um, because of the temperatures and the pressure, there should be no liquid here. They're very, it would be very, very rare to get any kind of liquid in here. If any liquid does appear, you'll see it on the uh, indication, but you should be able to evaporate it off. But normally there's no liquid produced at this point. Okay, because it's very hard in the mixed refrigerant system because of the concentrations of nitrogen and methane are very, are fairly high. Uh, so that will keep that condense, you know, any, any liquid from forming at this point. We need a higher pressure and a lower temperature to get the, uh, to get the uh, material to partly condense. Okay. So now we come off here and we compress in another stage. This is a much lower temperature because of the chilling than you normally would see on the suction of a uh, compressor. And then uh, again we compress on the discharge. We have a cooling water uh, a cooler. And then it's taken off for additional chilling with um, propane refrigeration. OK? Yeah. So we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. We'll, get, we'll, we'll follow this line in a little bit. I just want to go over some of the features here on the mixed refrigerant system on the compressor. OK? We have uh, an anti-surge system, this X, XIC, for each stage. And we have a kickback valve here for the high pressure stage. So we'll take some of that cool, high pressure uh, flow and then recycle it back through the stage here, OK, under control of this XIC. Same thing for yeah. the first stage. We have an anti-surge controller here controlling the kickback valve, which is taking from in between these two coolers. It's taking yeah. that gas and then bringing it back into the suction drum with the makeup, uh, with the mixed refrigerant returning from the main cryogenic heat exchanger. OK? And that's yeah. basically your, your main process flows. There, of course, are connections for emergency. Um, uh, you've got a flare here. You've got your blowdown, blowdown valve over here on the second stage, and uh, then you've got some drains here. You can take off for disposal in case you do get any kind of liquids accumulating here, which is extremely rare. Uh, if something does accumulate in here, you can take it off. Okay, and that's mainly it. Any any questions on the compressors on the mixed refrigerant compressors? It's pretty pretty straightforward. Yeah. Okay, and you all, yeah. at any time you can add if you have any kind of leak of material or some something has happened you you've blown off or taken off some material for some reason you can add, always add makeup or you can also adjust the composition. One of the one of the um, one of the mysterious things about the C3 refrigeration system is it's hard to really know what your true composition is. Uh, <laughs> do you, does anybody have experience with these systems? Well, uh, no, not very much. Uh, no, but one of, because, because, it's a, because it's multiple compositions, what happens yes. is in the refrigeration systems, as you, if, like for example in a C3 refrigeration system, you've got a lot of evaporators. And you've got a uh, an accumulator, but 
what's interesting is, is the pressures go up and down, and there's more or less changes in levels in each of those. You can, you, you, because it's all propane, you basically say, okay, my levels are going to go up and down, but eventually they're going to stabilize, and I should get the same level again for the same pressures. What happens in a mixed refrigerant system is a little different. Some of the liquid condenses, and because it's the, it's the heavier components are the ones that actually condense, and they may revaporize and condense, and it's not as um, it's not as consistent as say the C3 system, because it's you don't not everything condenses. The, the, the nitrogen, especially, and the methane, are are uh, are very hard to condense. So what happens is is at any point in the system, you may have a higher concentration of nitrogen because it's in the vapor in some systems in some parts of the mixed refrigerant uh, piping, especially when we get back to the, um, when we start looking at the main cryogenic heat exchanger, and we'll get to that in the, just the next, next thing we'll discuss. So what happens is you really don't know what the overall composition is because it's, it varies depending upon whether you have liquid or vapor, as opposed to C3 because everything's C3 in the C3 system. There's only C3. So it's like, what is the average composition? Mm, that's a hard question to answer. So when you're actually running the unit, it, you know, when you have to actually start it up and, and charge it up, you have to kind of use some, some rules. And there's actually in the in the instructor manual, there are some um, guidelines on how to do that. But it's very difficult to know. The, the bottom line is, it's very difficult to know exactly what the composition is overall because it's it's just it's because of the nature of how the composition can be different at different points in the mixed refrigerant cycle. But I'm just going to want to just point that out. And so uh, the bottom line is that you'll uh, after startup you'll have to make some adjustments. By uh, say for example, you can't achieve uh, a lot of liquid. So what you should do if you if you're not making enough liquid, you add more of the heavier components, right? And if you've if, you've add, if you keep adding heavier components, you might get the pressures up too high in the system. So you might have to bleed off some of the uh, gas somewhere. And we, we can see how we can bleed off some gas at the, at the main cryogenic heat exchanger. So you'll have yeah. to do these manual manipulations. And it takes a little, um, not, not guesswork, but it takes a little while to get used to it. But, the, but, the, but the, the bottom line is if you're not making enough liquid, you should add heavier components. If your pressures are too yeah. high, you should vent, okay? But you have to do it in a very careful way, you know, so as not to make a major disruption to the to the process. And this is very different yeah. than running a C3 refrigeration system because it's only it's only C3. So you have to be a little bit of almost like a cook. You know, you have to know the, how to put the ingredients in just the right to make it kind of nice. You know what I'm saying? So it gets to be a little bit of a more of an art than a science sometimes. Okay. Yes. Yes. It's a very very and, interesting. Uh, do, you think, do you think any difference between summer composition and the winter composition? Whether the ambient temperature is making much difference in the Mars system? Yeah. What's the question? No, is it very significant whether the summer or the winter is making for the MR composition to be on an average level? Uh, well, you know, the cooling rate and the liquefaction. Do you think that the ambient temperature yeah. is making any, any impression about the composition? That's a great question that I do not know the answer to. But <laughs> you, can tr you can try it on the simulator because you can change the ambient temperature and see what happens. And so you might want to play with the and one of this is a actually would be a really good exercise for you to try when you start using the simulator. Yeah. Answer, try to answer you that question, and go in, there actually is a fault for the instructor. One of the faults I'll show you over here. I don't know if you learn how to use the yeah. faults yet, but you go to instructor when you're instructor mode. The trainee can't do this, but the instructor can. And you'll see down here you have your ambient temperature, fault number thirty one. So it's normally at 35. So you can change that, then see what happens in the process, let it settle out, and then you could come back and go, oh, hmm, 
maybe I want to add some, you know, maybe I want to change some of these. You know, I want to change some nitrogen. I want to add some more propane. Well, it, it, I, I don't know the answer to your question, but it's a very good question. And you, the, thing is, the thing is, you can answer it with the simulator if you'd, if you'd like to study oh, yeah. that. And I, I'd, I'd recommend, once you get used to everything, try that out. And uh, you, might, you might be able to answer your own question. <laughs> but you can do it. It's a good question. I don't know the answer. I'd have to play with this. <laughs> so we are just beginners, eh? We are not the uh, DCS operator or something. We are learning, eh? Actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. It's, when you have questions like that, it becomes a lot of fun on the simulator to go. Hmm, let me try that. Don't be afraid to try it because you just you, you know you won't break anything. You just reload the initial condition if you get into a bad operation. So, so, so I recommend uh, trying uh, trying that. Try to answer that. You know, investigate that. It will it will show you what happens. But I don't know the answer. We have to ask the uh, simulator. Good question. Okay, so anyway, that's the um, you have these con you have these ab the ability to change these. You can make the yeah. adjustments in the operation, see what happens. You can optim you can try to optimize things. You might get a little, you know, if you if you adjust the ratio of these, perhaps maybe if you vent a little bit, add some more ethane. I don't know. Maybe you'll get a little lower fuel rate for or get a better production rate. Hmm. But you can actually do these on the simulator, and they will give you some kind of result. I don't know if they're the exact result that you might find in the plant, in a real plant, but they'll, they'll be directionally correct. Okay. okay? Yeah. Ray, can we have a break from five, ten minutes? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, we can take a break and then come back. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, and that, it shouldn't be too much longer for my, uh, my intro. We just have to go through the... Um, okay the main cryogenic heat exchanger, and then the C3 refrigeration system, and then that'll be it. Okay, let's take five minutes and come on back. Yeah, sure. We'll okay.
Isto vam je staj, vam je to ne staj. No, vam je, ne smo. This is a different problem. So, that's a big problem. Yes, today we are back. Okay. <laughs> I've been having fun. <laughs> yeah, we saw you're juggling a lot of screen here and there. Yeah, yeah. I'm just making sure I I I, I I'm just making sure I remembered everything. <laughs> <laughs> just double checking my brain. <laughs> It's fresh time. What time now, sir? <laughs> okay. What, what so, is the time over there? I'm sorry. What is the time over there right now? Oh, it's just uh, almost two o'clock in the morning. 
<laughs> morning, Doug. Yeah. Very, very good, fresh brain, Doug. Yeah, you know, um, normally, normally I work in the late in the evening. Maybe not always this late, but sometimes I do. And some, uh, um, I find that I can concentrate best because it's very quiet. And I'm working oh, yeah. later, yeah, because every everything's quiet. There's no no trucks, no cars, no telephones, no people, nothing. So I can just focus on my job, you know. So you, you, the best time to concentrate, but you have to make sure that you don't fall asleep. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> so I, I I'm okay. Uh, I'm very very uh, I, I'm. Uh, I'm enjoying this, so it's uh, it's good. That's great, great, great. Uh, and we appreciate that. Uh, you yeah. Are not yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's worked out. This is the <laughs> first time I've been doing a presentation over the internet like this, so it's 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 much it's, it's worked out very well. I'm I'm very happy with it. Yeah. In fact, it is basically you know it's like more interactive, more uh, like you know responsive also. So it's all uh, we are also like you know totally engraved in this. Yeah. Okay, so let's continue. So, so what we've got here on the mixed refrigerant is the uh, discharge from the second stage is now going to be chilled very, very cold by sending it off after the second stage cooler. We're going to send it over to the uh, C3 refrigeration system. And it's going to come in here at and it's going to go through a high pressure, then low pressure, uh, medium pressure, and then a low pressure evaporate set of evaporators, which will be become very, very chilled. Okay, and on the uh, re C3 refrigeration side, it's being supplied from the uh, the accumulator, and then it's subcooled, and then it's taken by by uh, further cooling from the uh, uh, the accumulator, uh, the C3 refrigerant is coming in this way, and this is acting as the uh, receiver for the subsequent medium pressure, and then the medium pressure is acting as a receiver for the low pressure. And then all of the vapors are returned back to the compressors, to the compressor, uh, C3 refrigeration compressor. Okay? But in this case, really the mixed refrigerant is what we want to follow, so it becomes very chilled. And going through these and chilling at this high, higher pressure, it's now going to form a liquid vapor mixture on the return. Okay? And that's basically yeah. how it... So now the mixed refrigerant system is now exhausting its heat into the C3 refrigeration system. Some of its heat into the C3 refrigeration system. Okay? It returns back. And then there is the vapor liquid separator. This is the re uh, mixed refrigerant separator. The uh, the line comes in here. Um, we'll zoom in a little bit. One more time. So the mixed refrigerant comes in this way. We have a, just a two phase. It's a separator. The separator just to segregate the ah we got another little problem there. To separate the uh, the liquid and the vapor in the line, and it channels them to different parts of the uh, main cryogenic heat exchanger. And uh, you'll there will be a level in here. This is actually one of the um, the inventory levels you'll see, just like the accumulator. Okay, so the separator will have a level. It should be fairly steady within reason. When you're charging up, this is the level you're going to look at to make sure that you've got liquid. Okay? And then the liquid yep. one's just under flow. You'll see some level here, and it'll just push push down through this uh, circuit here. Okay? There's some control valves that, control valve down here that regulates that. The vapor, the same way. There's also a control valve uh, or two downstream. Okay? So yep. very cold here. Liquid and vapor separated. You got the ability to flare here in case you overpressure. You want to uh, uh, vent off some material. You can do that. You can also uh, vent off, uh, take off some liquid if need be. 
Okay, if you're a good operator, you don't have to do that too much. If you're like me, when I was just learning it, uh, I was doing that a lot. <laughs> I put too much I put too much uh, propane in, and I'd start throwing the propane away. So, so, so that's what those are there for. Okay. So now we take the liquid and vapor over to the main cryogenic heat exchanger, and the we'll follow first the liquid stream. So the mixed refrigerant liquid will come in, and it will go in to the warm bundle. It will it will get colder, even though it's already cold. Will get colder even further because it's going to be absorbing, uh, giving off its heat to the um, to the low pressure mixed refrigerant on the shell side, and the that refrigerant is formed by the um, uh, the, the very cold. Uh, a mixed refrigerant on the shell side is formed through these Joule Thompson valves. There's three of them, okay? And the first one is on the liquid. It's on this line here. The liquid chills down. It's still at uh, high pressure. It chills down even more. It's still at high pressure because it's exchanging with the mixed refrigerant that's coming in at the top and in the middle. And then it's re returning. That, uh, that warmer mixed refrigerant is going to then be channeled out and returned back to the uh, mixed refrigerant compressor. So it chills down. The liquid chills down even more. It really, really, really gets cold, right? And then it comes out of the uh, bundle, the cold bundle. And then it's passed through a Joule Thompson valve. And it creates the uh, required temperature uh, much lower than the uh, minus 149 here. So this guy, this valve, and this valve with a little bit, these two guys are, these two uh, valves are the ones that are really producing the lowest temperatures in the system, okay? As that liquid depressures goes from a very high pressure to the low pressure side because the shelf side of this is open to the suction of the, of the uh, first stage, which is the lowest pressure in the, system, in the uh, mixed refrigerant system. So you're going from the high, very high pressure on the high pressure side in the second stage, and then down low. So there's a lot of chilling going on here. Okay. Yeah. Um, the uh, this is under control. This valve is under control of a pressure ratio controller, and we'll go back to the to that to see how that actually works. Okay. Um, yeah. But the how much flow goes out of here will be based on this, this pressure ratio controller. All right. So that's the one, that's the, the liquid. That's the main, its main path goes through here and there. Uh, vapor, okay, now comes in off the separator. And the vapor actually takes, uh, this is this line. It comes in and it splits a little bit. As we discussed before, it actually gets chilled down by exchanging heat with the flash gas coming from the LNG flash drum. So this very cold flash gas now is chilling down this vapor and producing some liquid in here in this line. It's not a, it's not a huge, it's not a large stream, but it's, it's still enough to uh, give us some additional cooling. Um, then it goes through another Joule, a Joule Thompson valve and a, that under control by this TIC just to keep this return temperature regulated, or the, and then uh, a pri providing additional chilling uh, to the main cryogenic heat exchanger to the top, to the cold bundles here. So now this is then distributed on the shell side, and it goes through all those windings, and it makes this really, really cold so that it, uh, its primary purpose is to liquefy the LNG in through this bundle. Okay? And it also... Uh, uh, absorb some heat from it, the liquid that it actually created it. So if you see here, it's kind of a, 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 if you will, a recycle. Because this bundle is the mixed refrigerant liquid on the tube side. And so it's, uh, it's getting chilled down. It's giving its heat up to its, essentially what's going to be itself after it goes through the Joule Thompson valve. And then it goes on the shell side. Okay, so that what that that kind of internal recycle 
provides that really deep chilling. It gets that temperature down really, really, really low by a consequence of this arrangement. Okay? And that's what lets the yeah. main cryogenic temp, uh, heat exchanger achieve those very low temperatures to uh, condense the LNG, to liquefy the LNG. Okay? Yeah. So this comes in together. Okay? That's the vapor. So some of the vapor. And the main part of the vapor, of course, goes into the warm bundle, the middle bundle, and then into the, um, sorry, uh, the liquid comes in this way. Sorry, my mistake. Boy, I got, cr I got crossed up here. The liquid, let's do that again. We got to go back. The liquid comes in this way. Chills down, chills down, and then goes through the Jew Thompson valve and goes into the middle bundle. Okay, and that's under ratio of a flow con flow ratio controller. There's a ratio of vapor to the liquid uh, ratio is kept constant. Okay, um, so this provides a lot of chilling. This liquid, the vapor. I was calling this the liquid before, but I apologize. My mistake. The vapor is chilling down, chilling down, chilling down. And the vapor is condensing in here into a liquid and then passes through the Joule Thompson valve. And the vapor is the part that, the vapor is the one that actually provides that deep chilling, this vapor stream. And that would make sense because the vapor, anything coming off the separator, the vapor would be the one that has to get uh, very, very low to become a liquid, very, very low temperature. So that's the one that's going to achieve the lowest temperatures. So it's this, uh, this is the vapor. I'm sorry. This came from the vapor. All right. And then the other vapor stream comes in this way. And these two together combine and then provide the deepest chilling in these, in the, uh, these bundles. OK. Um, and the liquid, again, um, comes in this way cools down, same way, does the same thing, except only does it through the middle bundle in the same way. Now, of course, there are uh, blowdown valves and to, uh, to vent all these off. Okay. Yeah. On the, uh, as I mentioned before, you can vent off. One of the ways you can vent off is through this uh, pressure controller. This is actually a, uh, just in case you get overcharged, it gets too high, too hot, the uh, this pressure controller will vent the flare. Okay. Normally it will stay closed. Sometimes during startup, if you overcharge it, this thing will open up. I've done it. <laughs> it's it's fairly easy to do if you don't watch, you don't pay attention. But that's why we have a simulator so you can you know get the principles down. And okay. All right. Okay, um, so that's basically it. So what we're doing is, to summarize, we're taking that very cold liquid and vapor from the separator that we got from chilling down the with C3 refrigeration. We're chilling, we're kind of, if you will, recycling the heat inside by uh, keeping the pressure high on the tube side for the vapor keep the pressure high on the, on the tube side for the liquid. And then both of these vapor streams, actually, well, these vapor streams are passed through Joule Thompson valves to get the deep, deepest chilling possible. And then the counter, counter current comes back and chills down all these other bundles. OK? Yeah. The, the pressure on this side will be vented out in case of high pressure. And then finally, the, the mixed refrigerant between the the, uh, the the vapor streams that have gone through the Jewel Thompson combined with the liquid that uh, goes through the Jewel Thompson, these combine. Evaporation is going on. There's liquid, but it's evaporating as it absorbs heat from these streams. And eventually, all of this comes out. The mixed refrigerant comes out as a vapor at the bottom, and then is returned back to the um, to the compressor to the first stage of the mixed refrigerant compressor. Okay. Now, one important line here you'll need for startup, 
a couple of these, um, is this line here is a fast way to bring in methane from the um, from the scrub column overhead. Of course, this is the this is the uh, natural gas that we want to liquefy. But during startup, you can really bring in larger quantities of gas by this line than you can by uh, this line. And uh, the the procedures just just be just be aware that there's two ways to get methane into the system. That's what I'm really trying to point out. This gives you a a finer control over it, over how much methane you want to add. I'm sorry. And this hand controller lets you put in a lot of methane. So this is more for bulk loading of you know charging methane into the system at startup. The other one is for fine tuning. Okay. We're fine-tuning the methane. Okay, and uh, then this is defrosting gas. This is to uh, warm up the uh, uh, the system. So this is just, uh, I believe, it's just methane, but it's just uh, methane or nitrogen. I forget. I have to I have to read the instructions, but that's also used during just during startup. Okay, startup and or shutdown. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically, that's the concept. The concept is that mixed refrigerant, because it's got nitrogen in it, it's got methane in it, some of those components, those two components partially liquefy, they can produce really, really, really cold temperatures through these Joule-Thompson valves. And that's what drives that temperature all the way down. After that, it's just basically a, you know, it's a regular uh, refrigeration system. You know, going back to the compressors and uh, removing the heat in the condensers and 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 that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on the on that system? It's a little little complicated. It's a little spaghetti-like. It's a very you know very you know highly engineered heat transfer system. Um, yeah. Maybe just a note uh, in the model because the way they design these uh, two bundles. There is a um, uh, there there are uh, distributors, and the mixed refrigerant gets dis well distributed all through this, um, and that's always assumed to be constant as a function of condition. So if the rate increases or decreases or whatever, those those distributions stay the same. So it's just a just an assumption that's made in the model. It's probably a pretty good assumption from what I've read on the on the design of these. Uh, Heat exchangers, um, and that's that. And the next thing we'll do is we'll talk about the controls. If you have any other, you don't have any other questions, we'll go into the controls. Any other, any yes. other questions on the mixed refrigerant? Uh, can you tell me the temperature pattern of this uh, MCHC T1? DI seven three four seven three three seven three six seven three five. Yeah, I can tell uh, you that. Yeah. How well, we can just is... well, we have it right here. There you go. If you can read that, and you can you can call this up on the simulator when you're uh, when you're running it on your on your system. Yeah. You'll have access to all those the same displays. Yeah. Okay. So you see here, we're achieving 140 minus 149 on the LNG uh, at the inlet after the after the Joule Thompson valve. We are minus 161, so you have about a 12 degree differential between the the coldest spot here and the outlet temperature. Okay. Uh, the temperature here 164 achieving coming out of here, so really really good chilling here. Um, the temperature here is one minus 152 upstream of the Joule Thompson valve for the main vapor rate. This is a smaller stream, and so after flashing and everything, you're getting down to minus 161. So um, then the liquid. No, can just... I ask you one question? Sure. 163.9 is Joule Thompson. 
downstream is 1659. Yes. So what exactly it is reverse acting or you know whenever Joel Thompson you get it uh, the cold 163 is down to 160. Yeah, well, in this case, remember, there, there are two streams that are mixing here. Oh, and this is a smaller stream. The larger stream is starting at minus 152. Yeah. So the, the, it's just the way it comes out because it's a mix of the two streams. But the minus 163 yeah. is actually a smaller rate than, than this stream over here, which yeah. is the main vapor line. Well, it's a good question. It's a good question. Yeah, but that's the reason yeah. because this is, a, this is warmer than this one. That's why. Yes, and uh, it is controlled by TIC 543. Uh, I'm sorry, which one? It is also intern, intern for the exchanger. You see? Oh, this one that here. Particular. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. It is QN. Right. Uh, so it, what is the connection of that? Uh, yeah, this uh, is the flash vapor comes in this way. So oh, this yeah. is. Oh, you see. Yeah. And, I remember. Uh, and, uh, well, the valve is uh, shown as reverse, you know. When you see, is it reverse acting or something like that? When you have the Jewish constant, you represented this valve, the actuation in the bottom. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear that. It had to be a little bit louder. I just, it's just, I think. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the position of the wall uh, just below the uh, cold uh, JT wall. Yeah. Yeah. S is, is downward. Why yeah. is it downward? Oh, that's just that because I, that's just because of the, um, the there was not a it's a very busy display, so that <laughs> the, the only way they could fit it, it we could fit it in. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything by being upside down, other than we had to do that just to uh, make the connection here. Okay, okay. Generally, yeah. when you have it reversed, it's say reverse acting, you know. No, oh no, 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 that's not that's not the case here. I don't well, that's not what the intention is to uh, to do that. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, it's just because the uh, uh, the the uh, display system is just you know there's just a lot of information to put on one one schematic. So uh, the person who designed the, the uh, graphic, it wasn't me. Uh, the our graphic designer, he uh, he laid it out that way because it was driving him crazy to do it any other way. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sometimes that's what you have to do. No. The um, the very it's a very complicated system. Obviously, well, you know, and conceptually it's not too complicated, but it's in the details it can become becomes very complicated. But the, the concept isn't as isn't too bad. But it, you know, you can see on the display, you know, when you have to put a lot of details on, you have to make some uh, adjustments. Yeah, so we got all together the temperature pattern 160, 152, 131, 120, and down under it will be somewhere around yeah. 37 yeah. degrees centigrade. No, no, no. Right. The return temperature is minus 37 on the mixed refrigerant. So. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. It's a good job. Okay. Good right. job. Okay. That's great. Thanks. And we will be around 119, which is uh, the incoming. The pressure of the column. The we pressure. have a battery. Yeah. Cell side pressure. Which, which pressure? High bar. The shell side of the MCHC. Oh, that should be up here. 3.5 bar. Oh, yeah. Up here on the uh, vent, the vent coming off, and the tube side will be down the bottom. Yeah, that's at 19, and then it starts at the. Uh, well, on the mixed refrigerant, that's different. The mixed refrigerant tube side uh, is over here is the separator. See, it's a very busy display, but that's about 47 bar. Oh yes. That's on the uh, that's on the vapor liquid separator, the mixed refrigerant okay. separator, 47 bar. So you got quite a pressure drop from 47 bar in both the liquid and the vapor, yeah. and then they go through the Joule-Thompson valves down to 
about 3.5 bar. So it's quite a quite a large pressure drop. Yes. And that's what gets you the uh, chilling. Yes, that's what I wonder. The variables are so important. Yeah. Okay. So it's quite high pressure on the tube side here, you know, in the mixed refrigerant side. And, and then, of course, it drops. There's a lot of chilling going on. So very cold. And when we come out of that, uh, from the CHC, the pressure, temperature is shown 37.1. Uh, probably it goes to 701, V701, right? Yes. The return. Yep. And that pressure is how much? That's the return pressure. Well, it's 3.5 in here, and I think it's around 3.4, but that's on this, that's on the, uh, this drum uh, is here. This is the mixed refrigerant, comes in here, and then it goes, here's 3.1 bar. Okay, okay. Drop. That's on the suction of the first stage. So, yeah, that's why that's why I recommended you know to look at the P and IDs first because the with the color and there's so many systems on the displays it becomes a little harder to see these initially. It's easier to learn on the P and IDs and then then you can uh, use the P and IDs to find these these lines yes. on the schematics. Yeah. Okay, but that's 3.1 bar at this point. So in your compressor, you're going 3.1 bar, and in the first stage, coming down, and you're going to 16 bar. 16.8 bar over here, 3.1 to 16.8 on the discharge of the first. Then you're doing some pressure drop, and it goes to 16.1, and then 16.1. And we come out at 49, 49 bar, do some cooling, go through the mixed refrigerant, go through the propane, and then we come back to the separator, and the separator is at 47. So you got about 2.0 2 bar pressure drop through the um, C3, evapor C3 refrigeration evaporators for the mixed refrigerant. And then that goes into the back into the uh, main cryogenic heat exchanger. Okay, so that's what the pressures look like. And you know, when you run the simulator over there, that's you. You know, you can check all these out, but you see it for the first time here. So. General idea about the system. Yep. Yep. It's always good. Yep. Good to know the numbers. Okay. So. The next, the, the last thing we need to know about the mixed refrigerant compressor uh, system is the pressure controls. And what the, um, there are two, uh, we saw two control loops. We'll take, the, we'll take the easier one first. Well, let me go back to the P and IDs here. That's a little easier to see on the eyes here. Okay. So there are basically, uh, this, there are three Joule Thompson valves. This is the smallest of the Joule Thompson valves, and we know how that is regulated. That's regulated by controlling the the flash gas flash gas outlet temperature as it uh, exchanges heat with uh, this small stream of the uh, the vapor mixed refrigerant. Okay, so that that's this that's the easy that's the easy controller. Okay, we have now we have to understand. How do we regulate these two Joel Thompson valves? So this one is the liquid one. And the liquid one is controlled by a, oh, we'll, make, we'll zoom in a little bit here. There's a flow ratio controller. So there's an actual liquid flow controller upstream of the valve. And this liquid flow is controlled in a ratio to the vapor flow. Okay, so yeah. this is the vapor flow coming from the uh, mixed refrigerant separator, V703, where we were when we came uh, after cooling with uh, C3 refrigeration. We have a liquid in a vapor stream. It gets split, and this is the vapor that's coming off of there. So the liquid rate 
through the Joule Thompson valve is controlled okay, in ratio to this vapor rate. Okay? So that's the oh, first one. So no. they want to keep the liquid to vapor rate ratio constant. Okay? Why now you say, well, now remember one of the things is you go, okay, but this could drain these, this level, right? I mean, the, the, this liquid comes out of the, the separator here, V703. So the, normally you would think this level might, you know, might, might disappear. However, what happens in the system is it's a closed system. So if you circulate more liquid, it just comes right back around because it's a closed system. So this adjusting, just keeping this ratio fixed um, is, is just the guideline to say, okay, we, we, we you know, we want to keep this, uh, this rate at design, you know, this ratio at design. And even though we might take some more, if we, if we draw out of a, a level, we eventually return it back there. So it won't actually end up making a significant impact on the separator level here. Because when you, when you first look at it, you might go, oh, well, if my flow rate's too high, I'll, I'll draw my level down. But it goes back through the, <laughs> it goes back through the compressor, it gets liquefied, and it comes back right into the receiver, right into that separator. So, so that's not an issue. So anyway, that, that's, um, that's how we regulate this flow rate. The vapor rate will depend upon, of course, the compressor speed. It will depend upon the mixed refrigerant composition because that depends on how much um, vapor remains after the uh, chilling by the C3. So how much vapor stays, it depends on that, the composition. And for the most part, you know, it's it's a lot of methane and and some some nitrogen, so um, so that will pretty much you know be a number that's determined by the speed of the compressor. Okay, this 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 vapor rate will depend on the speed of the compressor, and then the liquid rate they'll just pass through here will just be in ratio to that, and it'll just be um, easy to regulate that way as long as it's in the design range, of course. So finally, there's one last valve that needs regulation. So these, these two, this liquid valve and this smaller vapor Joule Thompson valve. So this is the big valve. This is the big vapor valve. This is regulated because it actually determines the vapor rate circulation uh, to some extent. Um, this is regulated by a pressure ratio controller on the compressor, on the mixed refrigerant compressor, okay, to keep that in a good range. So if we go and look at that, what is the, the ratio of? It is the ratio, this ratio is the ratio of the suction pressure on the first stage, uh, the, I'm sorry, the discharge pressure on the second stage divided by the suction pressure on the first stage. So uh, we want to uh, keep that pressure ratio constant for a given speed, and basically that will actually determine the um, where we want to run with the um, the, the, uh, the total vapor, vapor circulation, and then that is used to adjust the Joule Thompson valve. So that will actually, if we look back here, by opening and closing this valve we're going to increase or decrease the total vapor rate circulation through the system, through the uh, mixed, re, uh, mixed refrigerant system. And this is the, this is the main, main valve for doing that. Okay? Yeah. All right. And so that pressure ratio controller is, uh, and then what's, what also is about that is it keeps, when you keep the pressure ratio uh, controller constant, and this pressure essentially is, it doesn't control here, but this is an override pressure. But this pressure essentially remains your, your anchor pressure, if you will. Then what that ensures is that your 
this pressure will not be too high. You're going to keep all these all on the same pressure. The pressure, this pressure, and this pressure will kept, be kept in a ratio by opening and closing that valve so that this this pressure doesn't get too high. And that's really what it is. Think of it. Think of it almost like an anti-surge valve. In mm. essence, kind of like that. The same exact principle. Right. If the pressure gets too high, open the valve. If it gets too low, close the valve. And that's essentially essentially what you can uh, think of it like. It's almost like an, how an anti. It's a, exactly how an anti-surge valve works. So, so when the pressure ratio gets too high, you open the valve. It'll drop the drop that uh, differential. If it's too low, it'll close the valve and bring it up. And that'll ensure that you always got a, uh, the right pressure ratios across these stages. You won't get any high temperatures. If you have too high a pressure ratio, you might get some temperature alarms, high temperature, high discharge temperature alarms because you've got a high pr pressure ratio. So, but that the the when you're running it, the simulation will will show you that. So that's basically the controls on it. The pressure ratio control, which sets the vapor rate circulation through the mixed refrigerant system through the uh, main cryogenic heat exchanger. That's really going to set this flow rate in essence, right? Then the liquid is just a ratio to that vapor rate. So you're just keeping the liquid to vapor rate ratio, which makes sense because if you have a fixed composition, you know, you, you'll make so much liquid, you'll make so much vapor, you want to keep that regulated con uh, in, in a certain ratio. And finally, the last Joule Thompson valve, the, the smallest one, is this temperature controller, which we've discussed before. And that's basically it for the mixed refrigerant system. So um, a little complicated. Takes a little while to understand it, but that's that's uh, that's it. Any questions? Uh, the point uh, you you can call it LMR HMR in our place generally uh, when we explain the MR circuit. The top one is being called as LMR, and the bottom one is called as HMR. Is that apt? Uh, you can agree for that. Um, what does it stand for? The LMR and HMR. Light mixed refrigerant. Oh circuit yeah. And heavy mixed refrigerant. Circuit. I would agree with that completely. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's exactly the point oh, I was yeah. trying to make before. <laughs> We should have said that then. <laughs> yes, I, uh, yes. That's actually a better term. I like, I like that term. <laughs> I was, so that's that's why I was telling you. You can't really know the composition of that. Yeah, that's correct. Light mixed refrigerant and heavy mixed refrigerant. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Another point we saw that the mixed refrigerant compression screen. Uh, can you explain about the I-701, uh, SIC-771? Can you explain and elaborate on that? Wait, which one on is the MR, which one? MR compression. AD number 5. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, go to near to the turbine, huh? SIC, near I-701 on the top. Yes, turbine. Oh, right here. Side, yes. uh -huh. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, this is the same thing. The um, the the gas turbine is, is simulated in a very simplified way. The um, where uh, of course a gas turbine is a quite a complicated uh, unit. Okay, um, we're doing in the simulation just to get this speed regulated. We're just using a very simplified. Um, model, sub-model of the gas turbine. So the speed controller just uses it to, to adjust the, the fuel rate just to get a particular speed of power output to this. Um, and that's basically it. In reality, of course, you have a governor system and you have a, a, you know, a very sophisticated control system for the, uh, uh, you know, for the gas turbine. For the purposes of simulation, we're not uh, focusing on the gas turbine itself, we just want it as a device where we can adjust um, the speed. So this is just a you know straight PID 
uh, to the fuel rate, and that'll get us going for startup, for example. And that's its primary uh, uh, function. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Thanks. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, another thing is uh, normal speed. When we say, uh, suppose the speed variation, how far it is affecting the NCSC uh, configuration? Can you briefly describe? How far? It's advanced. What's the what's the, the range? Of, what's the range of operation? Yes. 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 Ah. Uh, yeah, let me uh, hold on. Good question. That's a good, you know, you ask good questions. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've, actually, I've actually tried to determine that, but what we're going to do here is I'm going to actually change the set point. I'm going to, I'm going to try to increase LNG production. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my set point from 3600 RPM, and we're going to do a little test here. I'm going to change it to uh, 3700 RPM. So if you see here, I'm changing this set point on the controller, and you see now I'm starting to get some speed up here. Okay? Yeah. And one of the things I can do, it, it's going to take some time before we watch the uh, uh, this, the uh, response of the, the, the system. So as an instructor, uh, I want to just do some tests. I can run the simulator as fast as possible. So I'm if you look up here, my clock is really going fast. So I'm in speed up mode, and you can see now I'm uh, getting some uh, some movement on my uh, my my speed now. So my output's almost a hundred percent getting there. So I'm going to reach my high limit on speed. I'm going to run out of power. I'm going to be at max power pretty soon. So I probably won't even reach 3,700 RPM. So that'll be the high, the answer to your question on the high end. <laughs> so I'm going to say somewhere between 3,650 and 3,700. Oh, there it is. Uh, we found it. OK, there it is. See 100% output? I'm pointing at it. So we're going to get about 3,655 RPM on the gas turbine. By, by trying to bring it up. So we're out of power. That's all we got on this turbine. So we can only go up a few, uh, 50, 50 or so RPM, 60 to 50 to 60 RPM right now. If the ambient temperature goes up, it will even be worse. Oh, I'm getting an alarm now. OK. I got a low temperature alarm as I change my pressure here and my pressure ratios that we're good okay now the question is by increasing the speed how much did my okay I'm gonna just change how much did the production change I know uh, I got to find my trends here So I didn't get too much more LNG here. I got 413 yeah. LNG. Okay. So now I can take this, and of course I can bring it down any way I want. But that's that's basically the upside. That says that's the max power I can get. So I'm I'm pretty much near the limit of the um, the machine. Okay. That answer your question? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you can do this. You can do this on your own when you, you know, when you, you run the simulator. Try making some set point adjustments and and things like that. Don't worry about breaking it because the only way you're going to learn is to try to break it. So, and you can. I, I'll leave it to you to try lowering the uh, the speed and see what happens before you run into trouble. Just remember this: if you change the mixed refrigerant system. You're going to have to change the C3 refrigeration system too, uh -huh. because you have to reduce the speed on that. 
Otherwise, you're going to get some really, really cold temperatures, really, really low pressures, because you're going to be not have enough vapor. So it's going to uh, you're going to have to reduce your speed. But you'll find that out. Just I I, I recommend making a, a speed reduction and see what happens. Uh, speed reduction on the on the mixed refrigeration system, and then you have to make some adjustments elsewhere. You'll get some alarms, and they'll start making some sense. Okay, good question. We found the answer. 3665 RPM. That's about all we can do. And if the temperature goes up, the ambient temperature goes up, that will be even worse. It will, we won't even get that. So. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Thanks, sir. Okay. So we just have one last order of business. Well, two last order of business. Uh, is to go to the propane refrigeration system. Now, the yeah. propane refrigeration system is we've we've looked at it. Actually, we've passed through and seen the evaporators. Um, it's a very straightforward system. Uh, three stages, as we can see here. Um, same thing. It's running a. Uh, it's being run by a gas turbine. Uh, taking fuel gas. A very simple. It's a simplified. You know. Uh, gas turbine. We don't put the detail in on the uh, its operation. Just we can, something we can get a speed control out of and get some power. The gas turbine exhaust goes over to, uh, as we saw, if we remember earlier, uh, is used to as a heating source for regeneration of the molecular sieves to heat the fuel gas up that will be used to regenerate the molecular sieves. Okay, so that's taken off there, and that's basically exactly the same approach as the mixed refrigerant gas turbine, except it has this connection over here. All right, so we have got a three-stage LP, MP, HP, yeah. uh, taking and gathering all your vapors coming off all the um, evaporators coming in into the first stage. And of course, this is an integrated machine. So this is actually, it's shown outside, but it's actually an internal. And we take additional vapor coming in on the uh, from the medium pressure uh, evaporators uh, here, and then coming in from these particular um, locations. This box means it's on the same page. So there's a C3 vapor from E604, and that's up here. So this vapor is connected down to here. It's a little busy, but this goes over to here. Okay. So all the evaporators collected for the medium pressure put in, combined with coming from the low pressure discharge internally, compressed, uh, passed on to the high pressure stage where it joins with the high pressure evaporators, all the, all the vapor coming off those evaporators. Okay. Let's assume that there's, there's any carryover. There's some local valve shown on here. These are not simulated per se. What it is is assume that these will just drain automatically. Uh, you know, as a local operation would be drained in case there's any kind of carryover or anything. So they don't really the valves don't aren't really simulated per se. It's just an assumption made that it'll be some carryover uh, that'll be drained off. And if there's an excessive amount, then your level will go up uh, and give you some alarm. That shouldn't happen. It's very difficult to do. Uh, if you if you do manage to do it, save the initial condition and send it to me. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, so that's basically it. Just a conventional um, C3 refrigeration system. Three, three. Uh, um, important thing is you've got again you've got your XICs. Your uh, these represent the um, anti-surge control. Yeah. And uh, taking your uh, discharge back, the uh, difference on this machine is because it doesn't have it only has one real dis one true discharge. We recycle back from that discharge from the uh, the condenser. There's no interstage uh, uh, coolers, for example. Uh, no intercoolers, for example. So we don't bleed off from a from a medium pressure stage back to a low pressure stage. We take it all from the high pressure discharge downstream. Yes. So the high pressure discharge is kickback, there's a kickback valve here to go to low pressure, and then there's another valve here to go to medium pressure. 
And there's one more to go to the high pressure stage here. Okay? And this is actually, uh, this valve is actually controlled by both XIC, that's 662, right? I think we have that. XIC 662 also uh, controls this valve, I believe, in the same way. Okay. So that's basically it on the, uh, the kickbacks, the um, minimum flow anti-surge uh, controllers. Um, we can also... There is a way to take off the uh, suction. We have a, a vent line here. Okay, this way. There's an HIC 663. We can take that off the flare in case we want to depressure the system. That's one. There's also a flare uh, takeoff to vent on the uh, first stage suction. Okay. Normally, you wouldn't do that unless there was a need for maintenance. If you leave the system charged up, you know, and then ready to go. All right. Now the the last item here is the condenser and the um, accumulator. So we come out of the uh, third stage. We've got some cooling water, seawater, another cooling water, seawater. Uh, condensing the the, uh, the vapor. The pressure at this point will depend uh, on ambient temperature and the performance of these uh, condensers. Uh, if the ambient temperature, the uh, seawater or cooling water temperature goes up, the pressure will be higher as is normal because the uh, you you the pressure on the system will go up until condensation occurs, until the, the actual material is condensed. So the, uh, the, pressure, the pressure at this point will, will depend on these condensers' performance. That material is condensed and then uh, sent to the um, accumulator, and this level will, will float in here. Um, because this is, it's normally a closed system, but because the C3 does receive um, some um, uh, material, you know, from storage and maybe from an uh, possibly could be an open system. We have a way in case there's non-condensables that get in. There's an automatic vent here. Normally that's closed, but in case some do get in, we've got that vent. And in case we are venting something, there is a little bit of refrigerant taken off from the high right back to itself. And then there's a small condenser in the top and then returns any condensate back down into the uh, uh, accumulator. And then that vapor is taken back off over, over here. Pretty simple system. I mean, pretty straightforward system. And then you have, of course, your blowdown uh, valves and the like. All right. And then finally, uh, here's your makeup again. We discussed that a little bit before, but here's your HIC. So this is going to be used a lot during startup. You know, when we have a completely empty system, we're just charging it up, so we're going to keep bringing stuff in as we get going. One of the things, of course, during startup, you're going to you see that, and if you've operated the unit before, you'll know that. As you start charging all of the evaporators and you start building levels in there, you're still going to have to keep bringing that propane in. You're just going to keep bringing it in. You're going to open and close this valve a lot. And just keep bringing it in as you keep uh, uh, filling up these all the evaporators in the system. Okay, so it's a it's a really good simulator. You, it's an operator will really really become a, an expert at uh, the refrigeration systems. Just that alone probably is worth it. You know, to to really uh, get a good skill for uh, a good commercial you know um, system. Okay. And then um, just to complete the refrigeration uh, loop, you've got the, um, all the takeoffs for the, uh, the high-pressure refrigerant. 
and of course there's this subcooler, so we get some additional you know heat cooling on uh, cooling on this, and you can see the differential. There's a temperature indicator here, just a little bit of sub more subcooling, so kind of like, and then um, then it's distributed as shown. So a little complicated, but just follow the lines and you'll understand all the connections. Just that during startup, you have to make sure, uh, especially you know, once you start inventorying this and you start taking off of here, making sure make sure you get these into auto as soon as you can. Once you get them into auto and everybody's automatic mode, uh, it'll tend to take care of itself, and you just have to manage it. You know, just uh, just double check the uh, the levels, but uh, because of the connections that these act as the um, accumulators for the other systems but um, it makes it a quite an interesting game to start it up and that's that any questions on the c3 refrigeration well uh, can you explain about this uh, equalizing line yes yeah what happens is um, in these systems in the condenser system as you know uh, the um, this is a small local line. It's not a very large line. Um, what can happen is you can get vapor pockets in here, where you can get a uh, uh, let's say that you were running a condenser and it was it was hot and you got some hot material in here and it uh, even though it was mostly liquid, you push a little vapor and hot liquid in here and you get a little you get a little pocket in the in the in the top of the uh, in the in the uh, the vessel itself. All that will, all this line does is just give you let anything that pockets in here. Uh, it will just let it come back to the condenser uh, and get pushed back in there. So this equalizing line just makes sure that there is no way to trap uh, a pocket of, of uh, a hot vapor in here, for example, and get a, a vapor lock. Okay. And that's different than this pressure being high. This pressure could be high because of non-condensables. This is just at a, you know, this might be, uh, you know, a normal pressure, but you're still getting a, a vapor lock because of uh, this is just slightly higher, and it's it, to the point where it's just inhibiting the liquid from being pushed in. Because this this will not because there's an actual level in this vessel. And you've got the vapor up here. It doesn't. It doesn't immediately establish an equilibrium in here. Okay. It'll take some time for that to do. All this line does is just make that process happen faster. That equal. That equalization. That e equilibrating line. Make the whole. The whole process happen faster by allowing um, uh, this to come back to the. Uh, this line to come back to the condenser. It's a very small line. It's not a large line because otherwise you would get bypassing. Okay. okay. There is very... another one near to that E six zero one. I'm sorry. Line from E six exchanger E first cooler E six zero one. Okay. Yep. Uh, there is a line come from the shell side and a valve and going back to the kick back like. Yeah, that's the that's the minimum uh, flow uh, takeoff. That actually comes off the shell, uh, the shell side, yeah. Shell side? Because at that oh, point, geez. because it's two condenser system, it's actually just cooled here. This is actually a cooler. Uh, there may be some partial condensing, but it's taken off the top side of it, so it's taken off only vapor. And then any other material is just passed, uh, and then eventually it condenses here. So that's why it's drawn this way. It's actually taken vapor off the top of the shell. Because uh, it's cooler, it and it also avoids pulling any um, liquid down here. Oh yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. Fine. So uh, just some power system don't have any pump at all, right? Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. We we six zero four accumulator. From the accumulator, it is directly coming to the cooler and then to the E seven zero four. Down. There is no pump in between. No pump. No, no, no. It because it's all no. Because the 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 the, the, the differential is across there. That's a good question. Very good question. Another good question. All right. Let's go back and take a look at it. 
That's a good question. There's no pump in here to push it down, right? Yes, because it's the differential pressure across here is the same differential pressure across the compressor stage. This is on the suction side in the receiver, in the um, evaporator. It's on the suction of this stage. This pressure in here is almost the same as the discharge pressure, less the pressure drop in here. So at this stage is pushing everything through. This compressor stage has got to provide the differential to push it through, and then it returns. Okay. Yeah. Anytime, anytime we want to bring down the level of this uh, six zero four going high. If you want to bring it down, well, if you really overfill it. Uh, yeah. you'd, you'd have to you'd have to vent off uh, probably here up up here you'd have to vent it off as vapor flare it off okay if you if you really overfilled the system I mean if all your all your um, well, there's two things you could do number one is you could raise the level in your uh, to accommodate it you could raise the levels a few few percent in all of your evaporators what that will do is draw down your level. Okay, so that's that's one option you have. If you don't have that option, then if this level got very high, you wouldn't you you don't take the liquid out. What you do what you will do with that is you'll actually just vent vapor from the system, probably this way through the flare line here, on this line here. And by doing that, you'll just eventually pull this inventory down. You know, take you know, take a little bit of time, but you, this is the way you would do it if you if you flared it. Okay. So. Anytime I want to drain, drain, suppose shutdown condition, I want to get it emptied out or something. Any provision, only flaring. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear. It's, it's, no, the the question is. We have a propane pump out system. Propane oh, you do. Out. Oh, yeah. We don't. We don't have a propane pump out system in the simulator. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Doesn't doesn't have the facility for that. So you'd have to take it out as vapor. If you have a pump pump out system, that's obviously a lot better. If you've got a a, a storage bullet or you know place you can pump it to, that's fine. Uh, this doesn't. So you'd have to. Uh, that's one of the things about a simulator, you know, about a different process is you've got if you've got a certain problem, okay, how do you solve it? And that's actually, a, yeah. I mean, I trust me, I've done that. I said, oh man, I got too much level in here, so what am I going to do? <laughs> I hope in the vent because <laughs> only thing I can do, you know. But if I had a yeah, pump yeah, out yeah. system, yeah, I would use the pump out system. It's you know, you have a yeah. you have a level indicator. And uh, you know we are just monitoring it anytime. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, whenever the level go down, we have the makeup system coming in, opening up the walls. Mm -hmm. And suppose I I overfill it. Mm -hmm. The way you just uh, made up the level to a higher level, you have to only flare it out in the simulator, right? Yeah, that's correct. Right. Okay. Okay. Because we have no other. We don't have another uh, line out, like a pump out line or something like that. Yes, that's right. You're right. And that's, you know, that's um, uh, that's the fun. <laughs> no, it's actually, it's a good problem solving skill because it, it's, you say, oh, we, don't, we have that, but that's, a pump out system's too easy. <laughs> the operator has to think now, how do I get rid of this? Hmm. <laughs> it's very easy to ask questions, you know. <laughs> you have to, you have to, you have to start right. thinking a little bit. Hmm. Yeah. I need to get rid of propane. How do I get rid of it? Okay. Um, it's way, way too full and it's getting a little dangerous. And the level alarm keeps going off on me. So, hmm. Yes. <laughs> you kept yep. the wall open and it started filling up, filling up. And, you know, you're yeah. all filling up. Well, okay. the important thing is you learn, you know, Take there's something you can do to relieve it. Now that, 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 that may, flaring is probably not the preferred way of doing it, but on the simulator, that's the only way he's going to be able to do it. So. Can you just elaborate on XICs? 
XIC662, which is, uh, you know, uh, about the V603 vessel here. V603 vessel XIC, you have a, there is a wall just above it. From here? From here? Yeah, can you see XIC662? Yes. Uh, can you elaborate on that functional? Uh, yeah, XIC662 here will also uh, adjust this valve the same same exact position as this valve. I just didn't have enough uh, connection, but these two valves are opening and closing together. Because okay, okay. The, simultaneous. I'm sorry. Uh, is it simultaneous or I mean, uh, is it uh, connected? Uh, you get the vapor to the, you know, when you say XIC, 661, 662. Yes. That's significant. Yes. It's independently lying here. So it's getting signal from XIC 662, correct? This this valve. Ah, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure. You're, I'm not sure of your question. I, I, it's a little. It's. A, I'm not getting a clear. Um, I'm not picking up clear too clearly from the uh, microphone. I don't know if you're farther away. If somebody's closer to the microphone, maybe we can. Yeah, uh, we are talking about XIC six six two. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The function. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You can just explain briefly. Explain about that function of that. Okay. The XIC is an anti-surge uh, controller. So the, you've got one on the uh, six six one, which will look at the flow temperature, uh, flow and pressure uh, differential, and so it's trying to keep the uh, this out of surge. So XIC661 is just a, it's not a, a, a very sophisticated controller, but it's enough to keep the flow rate that, uh, out of the surge, out of the, the, the compressor out of the surge condition on the first stage. So FI661 serves the first stage, and they will open the uh, anti-surge valve, as you can see okay. here, and bring it back, and, and, and uh, if the flow is too low, it will add it will, it will kick back flow so that the, the, the flow is maintained. Now, 662, because the machine is the machine is a little different than a usual machine. It's an integrated stages. So the uh, second and the third stages are, um, you cannot, let me see, the, the majority of the flow is actually internal in the machine for the third stage. So the third stage, the, um, the flow, the suction flow on the, on the second stage is metered, FI662, and becomes the, the basis for uh, the minimum flow controller. Uh, of course, there is also flow coming from the first stage. So a, a more sophisticated control strategy would look at the total sum of those two flows, because the flow through the first stage goes through the second stage, right? But in the simulator, we just have it as the, the suction flow coming in externally because this stage okay. would normally have this flow and yes. this flow. Normally compresses okay. both of these, okay? But, yeah. and so that's what we're doing with this controller, just the anti-surge, so we're just taking uh, that material off this signal and back to the, um, I wish they would go. So this is just bringing more uh, vapor flow back to the first stage, the second stage, or medium pressure stage, I should say. And the third stage uh, is not metered, the suction here, because mo most of it comes from the second stage anyway. So we move the third stage valve as w if we move the second stage valve. Okay, so that's how it, that's how it works. So 
there are two anti-surge controllers, three valves. These two valves share this controller's output, and this one does that one. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I got it. Okay. Yeah. It's three a valves. You can. Mm hmm. Okay. Three, three, three valves, and we have two controllers. So that that the, the two will be balancing or yeah, know, these sharing. Will, yeah, these will be open the same. These two. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I see. Clear. Thanks, sir. Eh? Thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I just, I Anything else on the uh, propane refrigeration? Really? Yeah. Okay. All right. I got one more thing to do. Go over, and we'll we'll be done. And I can go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's I okay. Missed, uh, oh, I, 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 it's not a problem. Okay, I appreciate that. <laughs> oh yeah, it's okay. I'm enjoying it. Oh great! <laughs> as long as I I'm enjoying blessed. it, we're good. Okay, so I the, am blessed. Right. Yes. The, la the last thing I want to go over now. You, you're experts now, all at the um, all the refrigeration systems and the process systems. Um, Don't put us that uh, beginners, beginners. <laughs> <laughs> so. The, this shows the uh, the interlock system. So the um, the main interlock, the um, there is a uh, emergency stop system, and the emergency yes. stop system I five hundred will stop yeah. everything. So all you do is it's the emergency uh, stop. On the simulator to activate it, we have in the back we have the the same diagram as you see on the P and ID is on the uh, as a schematic so fortunately that's a one for one so you have an H uh, an HS 500 you could click on it and then you can uh, you change its mode from uh, uh, okay and then you could uh, trip everything so now I've tripped all of those and you see they're reflected here yes okay yeah. Easy. Huh? I'm getting a whole bunch of alarms now. Technologies. Oh God. So I've tripped. I've just tripped the uh, the unit here. You can't hear the oh, alarms no, on your side, but that's what happens. No, I love you. It's like a real plant. It causes lots of alarms. I'm going to freeze. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do it. Go like that. No, no. Even the plan is, uh, they the just keep coming in. I'm just, I'm, I'm just acknowledging alarms. <laughs> More okay. coming in. The ball, balls will come to your throat. <laughs> it's just like a real one. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to turn my speakers down. <laughs> so you can see we, we tripped the unit. And the, and the like. So, um, oh yeah. So we're getting some some effects. So anyway, I just want to go over the uh, the system. So the emergency stop will trip all of the other interlocks except for the emergency blowdown. As we discussed mm -hmm. before, the blowdown system requires the trip as a permissive. So now, if I wanted to blow down the system, I could do that. But yeah. I I shouldn't do it at this point. But I I can do it. Okay. Uh, and see. so the system, so it's not a problem. I can fix this really easily. So I just go to my initial conditions and reload that, and we're good. Okay. Um. <laughs> you see, you started the flight so fast. Everything's good again. <laughs> Real easy. Split. So. Okay. Life so. is very easy. Yeah, it's easy. Just hit, just reload the initial condition. <laughs> Except you can't do that in the plant. It's very difficult in the, oh, yeah, in the real it. plant. So, so anyway, the, uh, just to review that, it shows you all the actions of the emergency stop, uh, what it will do, all the ESD valves. Uh, these will be closed, these controllers, these will be opened. Um, and the emergency blowdown will show you which valves are opened. Um, yeah. 
and the like. Okay, so you've got an emergency stop, emergency blowdown, and these systems are described in the instructor manual. Um, you see the LNG product total stop. There's a trip on the uh, on there. Most of these, if you see here, the um, if you see like a hand switch, that means it's a manual activation. Okay. Now some of these can be either manually activated or you might have a low low level. For example, here LLL 523. So we've got an LLL 523. Uh, indication, for example, um, and that setting is at, uh, I don't know, no, that's not the right setting there. That's not the one. Um, and that will trip on low level. I believe it's at 10%. It's described in the instructor manual what the setting is on that. Um, and if you see the output wrapped around, that means that the, the hand switch you can trip with it. You yeah. can also you need it to you need to reset it. You, you have to use it for as a reset switch. Okay, so uh, the the trip will not be reset automatically. You have to actually manually reset the trip circuit. So, for example, let's say that I manually trip this circuit, and I now I stop the pump. Oh, I can't do that. Okay, it's not an auto. I have to get low level in 523 on the scrub column reflux pumps. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the scrub column reflux pumps. And what I'm going to do is change the set point to, well, oh, forget that. What I'm going to do is put it in manual and set the output to 100. So now what I'm doing is I'm increasing the I'm maximizing the reflux and I put my controller into manual mode. So yeah. So it's it's uh now in manual mode and now you can see the level levels coming down. So at some point it's going to trip. So what I'm going to do is I'm I'm going to run it in fast mode and you'll see here the level starting to come down. Okay, so now if I go over to the interlock page you see there's the level here it's coming down and we'll see what it trips at but it's, it's listed in the um, I should be getting a low alarm somewhere oh, that's right Rip. Yeah, I turn my alarms off. Okay, so now that it's tripped, now the level's rebuilding. So now to reactivate the, so now if I try to go over, I what it does is it stops the pump. So so on the scrub column, my pumps are stopped. So if I try to start them. I can't start them. I run, it'll turn back to stop. Can't start them. So now what I need to do yeah. is reset. Okay. Now my level's still building, so I have to go back. And now I can start one of my pumps. Why would that one start? No problem there. So now this yeah. controller was put into manual zero percent output. So I have to put it back into uh, with an output twenty percent. So now I can reestablish my reflux. Okay. 
Now, of course, I've got some other alarms here. Windows OK. Levels going up. Um, I'm going to put that back into Cascade. Yeah. I'm going to put this back into Auto, set point 50. So I'm going to run it fast and hopefully get back to where I was. Let me go through my alarms. Okay. So. Now I'm getting I'm I'm getting back to where uh, where I started. Okay, so what uh, was important here? What I wanted to demonstrate, hopefully you, you saw that, is uh, you have to manually reset the trip to get the pumps to start. Okay, so if okay. something stopped, you have to come back here and get this into the OK state by resetting it. Of course, you can't reset it if it's in the trip condition; it'll just trip again. So, and then here are your. Um, your effects. It's also documented in the instructor manual. Uh, generally on low levels, uh, you've got the O level level on the uh, scrub column reflux pups. Uh, this is just a manual isolation. It's an LNG product pump stop. Um, and then you have your LNG product pump trip itself. And then you have a compressor. You have a whole bunch of things on your uh, fuel gas compressor. Okay, um, and then you have your mixed refrigerant and your C3 refrigerant compressors to be protected too. Okay, and that's basically it. I don't want to go, you know, they're, they're pretty self-explanatory, uh, just looking at the diagrams. Yes. But those are the systems yes. that are protected. And uh, that's that. So, and that's how you use the, uh, the reset switch, and, and uh, I think you'll have fun. So any any questions on that? No, just an operator question. You put the things from manual to auto, then to cascade. Or I saw you putting cascade and yeah, to auto. you're very observant. Yes. <laughs> I'm, just, uh -huh. I'm just asking. Well, yes. Well, uh, you know the old systems, the old control systems. Um, yeah. Of course, that was a necessity to do that, and of course, you had sometimes you had, of course, to. Um, match up the outputs. In this case, it's um, it's auto initialization. So you can go directly from manual to cascade because the set point was being tracked. Uh, okay. Let me just let me just show you that again. And uh, yeah, it was a good observation. I'm I'm glad you I you really I'm glad you picked up on that. Because I was like, oh somebody's gonna somebody's gonna say something. And you did. But yeah, let's say uh, it was on this one. So let's put, I put it in manual, okay? Now you'll notice that the set point's tracking. And actually, an easier way to see this, we'll go to the group display for this on the uh, reflux. Uh, and we can see all the, all the instruments in one... Um, Rub columns over here somewhere. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So um, FIC LIC five twenty three is the master of FIC twenty five twenty three. So if I manually change this output to twenty percent, okay, this mm -hmm. flow is going to drop. And you'll notice that the output here, this is an auto, OK? Yeah. Yeah. Put that in manual. Now you'll see that the output will be initialized. And it actually turns out when you put it back into Cascade, it will auto, it will initialize at that point. But so if I change the output, oops, oh, I hate when that happens. OK, 
Okay, you see this will, uh, will bump up. So I can actually just put that right into cascade, and then this I put into auto. It, the reason I can do that is because the set points track, and then it auto initializes the output. If I oh, didn't, yeah. if I didn't have that capability, then that was a that's a very uh, aggressive move. <laughs> that could cause some trouble. But I did that because I knew there was a I was I checked there was backtracking and initialization. So okay, so um, the the control loops are set up that way on the cascades. So it's it's a fairly yeah. safe it's it's made so that it's safe that you can go right to cascade if it's a if it's a cascaded controller. And uh, because okay. of that, but you should check you should know I the reason I knew is because I configured it. <laughs> So, but a, no, a, but a train. Point, a, you say, uh, very safe to be from manual and you go to just uh, normalize it, go to auto, then you yeah. go for a cascade. That's right, yeah. yes. Yeah, mm. that's right. So uh, the, the per, person who's unfamiliar with it should play it very safe, yes. I only no, did no, that. That's a, no, I was thinking whether I had to go for a wrong perception, you know, some, sometimes you have got a yeah. Thinking and conservative perception. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it's it's better to be a safe operator than a <laughs> bad operator. <laughs> but it's good you picked up on that. I'm very very impressed. It's good. Well, thank you very much, sir. Yeah. That's so okay. much uh, helpful. Uh, you are really okay. great. Yeah. Easy to ask questions, and you are answering almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, if you have any more questions, you can either just uh, email or uh, you know send a, uh, a question along. There's uh, contact information, and um, you know that question will get to me, and I can give you an answer if something does come up. So, um, so you'll, uh, I think you'll have some fun. Oh, great, great, absolutely, you are enjoying every moment of it. <laughs> <laughs> And that, that it's the breaks a, were very next. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, I, I guess I'll call the meeting to an end. Huh? It's only three nineteen in the morning here. So. Oh God! Oh, no, no, no. oh that's a long way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Initially, it was scheduled for only for two hours, but it went on and on actually. No, but you know what? These uh, these guys, uh, Mr. Babu and Mr. Uh, Menon. Um, that is great because you know they uh, uh, know the know the process. You know they, they know the uh, principles and everything, and uh, it's good because I, you know, they great questions and uh, you know we we yeah. explored a lot. So I think it'll be be good. Not a problem. Okay, thank you very much Ray, okay. for your. Uh, uh, it was a great um, training. Uh, even though we didn't feel that you know you were not here. Physically present, but uh, almost the objective was uh, achieved. I say overachieved. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, and uh, you're welcome. All right. Thanks. Nice bye. talking to you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good night. Have a nice sleep. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, Dave, one one last thing. Hello. <laughs> I just uh, recording. Thank you.